kind of white here is getting it set up for me. If I could ask Judicial Services to help with the TV. Thank you. Oh. Why don't we go ahead and go to 202. Smith. Um, generally, where in the house are these four images taken? Uh, these were in uh, a office type uh, room. Okay. And was that in the basement? Yes, ma'am. And what do you see in the image in the upper right hand corner? Uh, the upper right hand corner of exhibit 202 is a uh, an overall of uh, the desk area where there were a couple of chests and some drawers um, within the office area. Oh, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Is this office up, actually upstairs in the residence? Feel free uh, to correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the office? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And um, was there any items that turned out to be of evidentiary value taken from one of those um, trunks? Uh, yes, ma'am. In uh, the medium-sized chest, there was some digital, uh, portable digital device, flash drives, thumb drives, those sort of things. Okay. And I'm going to have you point to the chest that you're describing as the medium-sized chest. Yeah. Okay. And can you see that on the upper right-hand image as well? Yes. Go ahead and show that to the jury. And if I may approach the judge yes. with what's already been admitted in State's Exhibit 199 through Tech Culture. Um, can you see what 199 is? Give me just a minute here. Are you talking about item uh, tag 199? Well, our tag is 199. The state tag is 199. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask okay. you specifically about this particular piece of evidence. Yes. What's the APD tag? <laughs> uh, the APD evidence tag on that one would be tag number 117. Two zero four five. Okay, and in your search of the residence, can you tell the jury where that came from? Uh, this uh, flash drive, um, the blue and silver one, came from that uh, that medium trunk chest uh, container on the desk. Okay, and you documented that in your report. Yes, ma'am. Okay, let's go ahead and go to two hundred two. What what is two hundred? I'm sorry, two hundred three depict. Two three depicts uh, uh, another smaller chest that was on top of the medium-sized chest with what appears to be other items, uh, of thumb drives, flash drives, digital devices within it. Okay. And 204, what does 204 depict? 204 also depicts uh, uh, medium devices, uh, flash for uh, digital devices, thumb drives, those sort of things attached to the medium size chest that was located on the uh, desk there. Okay. And that um, center photograph mm -hmm. with the blue and silver, does that actually depict that thumb drive that's in physical form there? Uh, it appears to, yes, ma'am. Okay. And 205. Mm -hmm. What are the series of photographs in 205? Uh, this appears to be images of also the office area. Um, there are uh, multiple uh, cellular devices here um, between looks like what appears to be smart uh, cellular devices and um, smaller cellular, cellular devices, all seized and found within the office area. Okay. This representative of the cellular device, cellular devices seized and processed by APD? Yes, ma'am. Okay, 206. Okay. What kind of devices are depicted in 206? Uh, exhibit 206 uh, also shows uh, a magnitude of what appears to be um, a couple SD cards. Uh, looks like there's a lot of uh, micro SD card readers and uh, some uh, what appears to be SIM cards for cellular communication. Uh, as well as uh, external portable flash drives, thumb drives, uh, those of those sort of nature. Okay. And can you tell the jury the difference, you know, in your time in cyber crimes between a SIM card and an SD card, and then again, an SD card and an adapter? Yes, ma'am. So uh, 
this day and age we all have cell phones, uh, I'm assuming. And so that cellular device works within a network. Uh, there's different types of networks out there. That network is attached to a carrier, uh, which provides a SIM card. A SIM card basically is a small card that goes to that digital device that allows it to connect to the cellular network and communicate. SIM cards can carry small amounts of data attached to them as well, like uh, IMEI numbers, which are attached to the cell phone, uh, cellular phone numbers, those things, but that's about it. Um, GCI, AT&T, Verizon all issue their own SIM cards based on their cellular network. Uh, SD cards uh, are basically small cards that uh, can uh, go into a digital device and they carry data. They have the ability to carry this day and age up to almost a terabyte of data, which is a lot. Um, and that can uh, hold everything from music to um, notes to, to photos, you name it. Um, the SD cards, we've all seen those probably, they're very small in nature, but there's also a micro SD card, which can be the size of almost a pinky nail, uh, which also can carry the same amount of data that an SD card can. Um, the micro SD cards require an SD card adapter because most uh, devices only fit standard SD cards. And so the adapters, which you see here in the middle, uh, fit uh, what would be micro SD cards, which would be uh, like right here, these are micro SD cards. They go in there, and these are similar to a standard SD card right here. And it just allows it to, the, that micro SD card to be read like a standard SD card in a standard order. Okay. So on its own, that adapter wouldn't have any any information on it. This adapter without any SD or micro SD cards is identified. So there's no data attached to it. Okay. And um, what is on Exhibit 207? <clears throat> exhibit 207 is uh, a plethora of um, hard drives, SSD hard drives, standard disk hard drives. Um, these are uh, different drives that come from uh, your computer, your laptops, those sort of things. The, what holds the RAM, the data memory attached to your computer devices uh, is attached to, in these cases, these drives. There's a couple of different drives here. You've got exterior drives, which are uh, just like these, except portable. You can plug them into a USB device. Uh, these sort of uh, SATA drives would go into your computer itself. Uh, you can see for Sheba makes different ones, Seagate, uh, my Western Digital for my passport. And then they show what the device sizes. Like, for example, this one here in the middle is a 500 gigabyte uh, SATA drive. And what is an exhibit 208? <clears throat> Uh, exhibit 208 is just various, uh, looks like digital devices, everything from a couple uh, older cellular, I'm sorry, uh, digital cameras, uh, and then a uh, what appears to be an Acer laptop and a desktop. And that camera in the upper right-hand corner, is that a Nikon Coolpix camera? It appears to be, yes, ma'am, a 3500 Coolpix. Okay, and is there an SD card associated with that as well? Uh, it appears to be that there is a 256 megabyte SD card uh, attached to that camera sitting on top of it. Then 209. 209. Yes, ma'am. What is 209? Uh, 209 appears to be various uh, media platforms, either in what could be uh, rewritable disc, Blu rays, DVDs. Uh, I can't tell by looking at them other than the one in the bottom right corner that's rewritable. Um, these are your typical. Data disk. I mean, we all remember floppy disk holders, hopefully. And uh, these are just the newer version of those with uh, DVDs and Blu ray discs. They hold much, much more data. So, so all of these items um, and representative items that were seized from the home, what did APD do then with them? <clears throat> yes, all these items that are seized, they obviously are photographed um, multiple times and then they are transported and secured at the Anchorage Police Department uh, in place of the evidence. Some of the uh, Digital items like the SD cards, the SATA drives, the hard drives, those sort of things, uh, the laptops and the computers would be taken to uh, the Cyber Crimes Forensic Lab. And their uh, forensic techs like Angela Worthy or uh, Brandon uh, Hunter would conduct uh, on CR, I'm sorry, uh, in lab forensics on the uh, image or the devices being imaged. Okay. And did, and both Tech Hunter and Worthy have already testified about the work they done, but I just that they have done, but I just want to clarify those devices there in States Exhibit 199, particularly that blue and silver flash drive, you can testify were taken from the box on the desk in the defendant's home. Yes. That's all the questions I have. Good turn. Thank you. Thank you, my big Yes. Thank you.
Is it a short witness? Maybe yeah. Probably Let, yeah. Let's let's take a break. Fifteen minutes, folks. <laughs> Courtroom. Are there matters we need to take up, Council? I don't think so. I think we're going to have to effectively repackage this while we're on the Good. break. I'll give the acceptance to the district clerk to mark it. Okay. Let's take our break. Three and nineteen ninety nine oh one CR. Mr. Smith is here. Council are here. The jury's waiting for us. Should we bring them in, Council? Sure. Yes, sir. Okay. Let's do that. Please be seated, everyone. We've got our jury back with us. It's ten thirty two. Everyone else is here that needs to be here in order to resume the trial. And uh, I think we're ready to hear from the state's next witness. Judge, the state calls Dr. Um, <clears throat> Laura Gagliano, excuse me. Good morning, doctor. Up here next to me, please. Remain standing, raise your right hand, and we'll swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you'll give in this case, not before the court, will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please receive them. Please state your name and spell your last name for the record. My name is Lauren Gagliano, G A G L I A N O. Good morning, Dr. Gagliano. Good morning. Can you tell me what kind of doctor are you? I am a general dentist, and I'm a consulting odontologist for the Alaska State Medical Examiner's Office. What kind of uh, training uh, have you received to become a dentist? So I'm a 1995 graduate of Louisiana State University in New Orleans, Louisiana, and School of Dentistry. Um, and I am currently practicing, like I said, here as a general dentist in private practice in, in Anchorage, Alaska. I have continuing education in uh, odontology, while there is no formal postdoctorate uh, degree in odontology, there are continuing education classes postdoctorally. Um, I am currently and continuously um, furthering my education in odontology with seminars and classes and uh, meetings so that I can stay up to date and current with the field of odontology. What is the field of odontology? Very good question. So the field of odontology is the study of teeth, the study of um, tooth structure, and also it's talk, it's, it's study, the study of disease. Um, as opposed to a dentist, a dentist is someone who repairs teeth or restores teeth. A dentist is also uh, someone who removes teeth that are damaged. And a dentist is in the prevention and treatment of dental disease. And so you are both a dentist and an odontologist, correct? Yes, okay. And you said you are the consulting odontologist for the medical examiner's office? Yes. When did you start be start that position? Uh, that would be in 2009. And how many uh, times have you consulted with the medical examiner's office in that capacity? Oh, for identification. What? Well, let me let me rephrase. What uh, What is your job as the consulting odontologist for the medical examiner's office? What do you do? So I'm called upon when the medical examiner is unable to make an identification of an individual. Um, is that what you were asking? How many times I've sure. consulted? Yeah, probably oh more than a hundred. And in those times, um, are you always make, able to make an identification or what are you asked exactly to do? I'm asked to make an identification using dental records. Um, they forward those records to me and I'm able to make a comparison Then I'm able to make a positive ID. Okay. Are there times when you have a negative ID as in these records do not match? Correct. That and what, happens sometimes. And what kind of records do you receive? Uh, dental radiographs or dental x-rays. Um, I receive the um, postmortem, those that are taken after death of the decedent, and then I receive anti-mortem record, anti records, which are those taken when they were alive. Have you ever testified at trial before? No. 
<clears throat> At this time, Judge, I would move to qualify Dr. Gagliano uh, as an expert in the field of odontology. Any voir dire or objection? Oh, good. The court recognizes her as an expert in that field. And Dr. Gagliano, I want to talk to you about um, the case that you're here for today. Were you were you asked to consult um, with the medical examiner's office on the identifying remains of a skull that was found in 2018? Yes. Okay. Let's talk first about that. So how does how does your consultation come about? Do you get a phone call, an email? Um, a variety of ways. A phone call, an email, um, a text message. Um, I am then sent now post-COVID in a secured email documents. Uh, prior to COVID, I was asked to come down to the medical examiner's office for um, identification purposes. Okay. I want to take you first to um, the, um, let's see, the remains that were um, found along the Old Glen Highway. There was a skull. Do you know which case I'm talking about? I believe you are speaking regarding the case of Veronica. Yes. Were you actually asked to consult um, on that particular case? Uh, that case is a, a skull that the origin or the ID was unknown, correct? Correct. And were you, while the medical examiner's office had that particular skull, were you asked to actually look at other um, medical records, dental records, to see if you could provide some possible IDs of some potential uh, IDs for that particular skull? I was asked to come down and identify what records they had obtained. Um, the skull that was found did not have a lower jaw mandible. Um, so that's very important because then that will rule out a lot of things. They um, were able to take uh, post-mortem radiographs, and then when they located anti-mortem radiographs to be uh, compared to, that's when they called me in. Do you recall for that particular skull, if you were asked to actually look at a number of, uh, of dental records to see if there were possible IDs? I don't recall. Okay. I want to, um, just may I approach the witness? Yes. Okay. Okay, I've given you um, a number of exhibits. Those are marked state exhibits 282 to 293. Okay. Just in general, do you recognize those exhibits? Yes, I do. Okay. And what in general, what are those exhibits um, pictures of? These are pictures of postmortem and antemortem radiographs. Okay. And I want to take you first to exhibits. So you, you get called down to the medical examiner's office um, regarding um, the skull, and you said missing the mandible. What was, why is that important? Because it leaves only the skull for identification purposes and the teeth and the maxillary arch, which is the upper arch. Okay. And you said you were called down to the office, the medical examiner's office? More, More than that. likely post, uh, excuse me, uh, pre-COVID, I would go down there. Okay. And um, in this particular case, um, this uh, we are, uh, I'm going to reference a medical examiner's office uh, number. Would that help you clarify which case we're talking about? Yes. Okay. And this is medical examiner's office number 2019-00559. Okay. Okay. And um, this particular skull was located in, I believe, April of 2019. Does that sound about That's correct? That's all right. Okay. At some point in time, you were provided the medical records, the dental records of Veronica Abuchuk, correct? As a possible as a possible ID for that particular skull. Yes. Okay. And do you recall about when that happened? Uh, more often than not, they provide me with both the postmortem and antemortem records on the same day. Okay. And do you recall about the time of the year that that happened? It was probably in April. I, okay. Um, I, I showed you. Um, uh, uh, the letter you provided to the medical examiner's office, would that refresh your recollection? Yes. Okay. May I approach it? Yes.
Does that refresh your recollection about when you reviewed those re records? Yes. Okay. With that letter that I'm showing you have been written in, in close in time to when you've actually reviewed records that the medical examiner's office sent you? Yes. Okay. I've dated that um, when I received or when I reviewed the message, the message that the text message that I received from the investigator was two days. Um, uh, was The letter was written two days after that. Okay. And what are the date? What's the date then that you were asked to consult? Our, October uh, 13th was when I wrote when the letter was written and October 11th was when I received the text message from Stephen Hill. Okay. And so does that mean sometime between the 13th and the 11th, you reviewed records and made a positive ID? Yes. Okay. Let's talk about what are the records that you reviewed? So the, the records that I reviewed uh, were taken by uh, the team at the dental, excuse me, at the medical examiner's office. And that was the postmortem dental records. Okay. And then they also located the antemortem records and those were compared. Okay. So the medical examiner's office gets a potential ID. They obtain the, what dental records they can to provide to you to compare mm -hmm. the dental records before this person, while this person was alive versus the medical records that the medical examiner's office has based on uh, now after they have passed away. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay. So looking at exhibits 282, 283 and 283, do you recognize those? I have a 282. They're on, oh, sorry, they're back. Yes, okay. I do. And generally, what are those? These are the antemortem um, radiographs. Okay. So antemortem anti -mortem means before, Pri while prior to death. Prior to death. While okay. 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 And then going then to exhibits 284, mm -hmm. 285, 286, and 287, and 288. Do you recognize those? Yes. And what are those? These are postmortem radiographs. And do you know who these radi both these antemortem and postmortem mortem radiographs uh, belong to? They belong to the case of uh, 2019. Dash zero zero five five nine Veronica Abuchuk, and I apologize if I did not pronounce that correctly. And then looking at Exhibit two eighty nine, do you what is that? Two eighty nine is um, dental records that are post mortem and anti mortem. Okay, and those do those also belong to the same particular case for the medical examiner's office? Yes. Okay. At this time, Judge, I would move to admit and publish two eighty two to two eighty nine. Admitted. Is the red light still on? Yes, that is still on. Okay. Okay. So here we have exhibit 282. What are we looking at in this particular exhibit? This is the antemortem uh, radiograph where there are three restorations or fillings. When you go to the dentist, um, the dentist um, finds a cavity and they will restore the tooth or repair the tooth with a dental filling, whether it's a silver filling or a tooth colored restoration or even a crown. Um, and these are unique to the individual. Uh, the amount of decay, the size and shape of the decay determines the size and shape of, of the restoration. Um, also the material, amalgam or composite or crown even determines the type of restoration that is received. The dentist technique is also uh, a factor in restorations or repairing the tooth and the tooth itself obviously. Um, is a factor in those restorations. So this makes uh, dental restorations or dental fillings very, very unique to the individual. Uh, this individual has a restoration that we call this an MOD. It takes up three services of this tooth. This is an occlusal restoration. This takes up one surface of the tooth. And that is another tooth that has a large occlusal with 
that dark area right here is decay on that specific tooth. And these this tooth number, these tooth numbers are tooth numbers uh, 13, 14, and 15. Going then to exhibit number 283, what are we looking at here? This is the same radiograph. Uh, this uh, is an anti-mortem anti -mortem radiograph of, of the same thing, uh, to uh, 13, 14, and 15, the same restorations. Is it just slightly maybe a different angle? It is at a, a different angle, which is why they may appear elongated. It's just the, the angle of the radiograph, the x-ray. Okay. So these are records you reviewed. Um, these are anti-mortem records you reviewed for Ms. Abuchak? Yes. Okay. Going into exhibit 284, what is this? So this is a uh, DEXIS overview. DEXIS is the uh, program that we use for dental radiographs that are taken um, at the state medical examiner's office. This is the upper jaw, part of the skull. There is no low, there'd be radiographs down here or pictures down here. If there was a lower jaw, there was no lower jaw recovered. Um, and this is all of the teeth that remained. Uh, what's important here is this area here, this area here, this area here, back here, is where teeth are not remaining. Uh, when a tooth is lost after death, there is a void in space like this where healing doesn't occur. So when a tooth is taken out when you're alive, healing does occur. So the bone can heal over. Okay. Um, go back to that one radiograph if you can. Sure. The one anti mortem. This yes. One. So you see these three teeth on this side. They're going to be on the radiograph on the top right up there when we go through. You'll notice that these two are very similar. This tooth is no longer present. Go ahead and go to that next radiograph. Okay. So that was back so, at 283. Now we're back at 284. We're back so this is the same restoration as in the anti-mortem radiographs. This is the same restoration as the anti-mortem radiograph. This is a slightly different angle, but there's no tooth here. And the reason why there's no tooth there is it was taken out prior to that. Um, and because in this particular case, I received dental chart notes in addition to radiographs, I was able to determine that that uh, appointment, I read through her chart notes and she had that tooth taken out. So it was allowed to heal, and that's why we see it differently than when this tooth that was lost postmortem is very different than when that was there. So based on these particular images, anti-mortem and postmortem, you made a comparison, correct? Correct. And based on that comparison, you made a positive identification? Yes, we go by areas of concordance. You only need one. I was able to find three here that were a match and led to a positive identification. And because dental, dental work is very, very unique, uh, as I said before, it's uh, similar to a fingerprint or a tattoo. It's very unique and it's very accurate in identification and very reliable in identification. So I'm gonna show a few more of the slides that the uh, you identified that were taken uh, in post-mortem, excuse me. This is exhibit 285. That's the one where the tooth was missing. Yes. Okay. 286. More dental radiographs um, with dental restorations. These were all post mortem. 287. And this was the one that I um, found the areas of concordance that were more likely to have a match because of the way that the radiograph was taken, because of the information that I had that a tooth was removed and prior to death. 288. Uh, same tooth, same restoration, different angle. And then looking at 289, what are we looking at in this particular exhibit? So the top um, radiograph is um, anti-mortem, and then these two lower are post-mortem. And this is where you can really see the difference here. So the angulation is different here. It's the same radiograph, or excuse me, the same teeth. This tooth is just missing. It's healed over. And then this restoration is a very, very good angle to that restoration that was taken in a dental office. This was taken at the medical examiner's office. Um, so with that in comparison, this is uh, 
who who the medical examiner's office asked me to identify with reasonable medical certainty and uh, and scientific evidence. So based on your review of those records, um, you determined that the skull belonged to Veronica Abichuk with, you said, a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes. Okay. I want to take you then also to another set of remains that you helped identify. Um, and I... Um, can bring you a report to help refresh your recollection. Sure. And this is in regard to um, a report that you provided to the medical examiner's office identifying remains uh, found along the railroad as belonging to Kathleen Henry. Yes. Do you recall? being involved in that particular identification as well? I do recall being involved. Okay. And based on refreshing your recollection from your report, about when did that happen? Uh, this was in October. Um, October 7th was the date of my report. I received a phone call from the investigator at the state medical examiner's office two days prior to that. Okay. Sometime between the 5th and the 7th, is that when you made that identification? Yes. Okay. And um, now looking at exhibits 290... 291 and 292. Do you recognize those exhibits? Yes. Okay. What exactly are those exhibits? Though? So they are the post-mortem and anti-mortem radiographs for this case, 2019-001495, Kathleen Henry. How did you, uh, do you recall how you received these records? Um, I believe that I, again, went over to the medical examiner's office and they had them for me to identify and compare. Okay. And are there a variety of ways you might receive anti-mortem dental, dental records? Yes, I can receive them uh, through email. Um, I can uh, uh, receive them uh, as an old record in, in the form of dental radiographs where you used to actually take film. Those would go straight to the, the medical examiner's office, though. Um, and then I would receive them there. Uh, do, do you know, do you recall in the method that you receive them, how the medical examiner's office might obtain these records from wherever they might, I mean, all over the state in lower 48? No. Okay. In this particular case, um, for Ms. Kathleen Henry, um, were the records that you consulted actually in paper form? I don't recall. Okay. Showing you. Um, yes. Does that look familiar? Yes. Okay. Um, but that look, does that look to you like it possibly was a fax of medical records that were sent? I think that these um, are copies of what were in obtained that would be my best guess okay um due to the quality of the uh the photocopy okay. um i don't since radiographs do not uh photocopy very well these were probably taken um off a computer and printed okay i'm going to show you actually sorry let's talk about exhibit 290 and 291 what are we looking at in those exhibits 290 and 291 are, these are the uh, anti-mortem radiographs. Okay. And exhibit 292, 292 what is that? Two is the post-mortem radiographs obtained from the state medical examiner's office. Okay. And then exhibit 293. Sorry, I think I missed that number earlier when I was... Talking about those, do you recognize that as well? Uh, yes, those are um, anti mortem and post mortem. Okay, I'd like to move to admit exhibits 290 to 293. Okay, you're okay. Um, exhibit 290, what are we looking at here? Those are the anti mortem radiographs of uh, Kathleen Henry. Okay, 291. Uh, Anti-mortem radiographs. 
And are these, these look almost like someone's fighting. Are these like upper and lower? Is that what we're looking at? Yes. Radiographs? So, uh, this type of radiograph is called a bite wing. Uh, it's the kind of radiograph that you bite on a tab and it's taken from the side, takes the top and the bottom teeth at the same time. Um, and we're able to see the restorations better that way. Okay. Uh, exhibit 292. So these are the postmortem radiographs from the state medical examiner's office. And that has, uh, it looks like there's upper and lower in this particular case because yes, there are, there the lower both. mandible was not, not missing, correct? Correct. Okay. So there's upper and lower teeth. So in this particular case, how many levels or how many, um, how, what number of concordance did you determine in making an identification of these particular remains? In uh, this particular case, it was three. Um, and it was in three areas of the mouth as well. Okay, let's go to uh, 292 and uh, 293, excuse me, and see if you can, can you explain this particular, uh, yes. these pictures to the jury? Yes. So this one here in the center, these are uh, postmortem radiographs. These on the side here are anti-mortem radiographs. That is actually also a, a post-mortem radiograph. So the areas of concordance was this tooth here. This is tooth number four, and it coordinates with this tooth number four here, anti-mortem and post-mortem. This tooth down here, this type of restoration, also coordinates with this restoration, anti-mortem, post-mortem, and then this one here as well, anti-mortem and post-mortem. So this is tooth number four, this is tooth number 28, and that would be tooth number, I believe, 13. And based on your review of those records, what was your ultimate determination about the identity of these remains found on the railroad? Uh, that they were of Kathleen Henry. So um, you testify that in each of these particular, in both of these identifications that you found three areas of concordance, correct? Yes. If, um, and you say that teeth are very distinguishable uh, for IDs based on a number of factors, correct? Yes. If you had found any areas of disagreement, um, what would that mean to you? Let's say the medical record said a tooth had been pulled, but the, the radiographs from the medical examiner's office show that particular tooth then it would more than likely not be that person. Okay. Um, by, by having a tooth removed and then having it not be present post-mortem is consistent with what normal life goes. Whereas if you were to do it the opposite way, say that the tooth was present post-mortem, but it wasn't present anti-mortem, that can't happen. Same thing with the type of restoration. If a restoration is one of the small restorations, and postmortem, that's what is identified. But then antemortem, it's a very large restoration on the same tooth. You can't go backwards. You can only move forward with the possibility if it was the other way around. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I believe someone said once teeth don't grow back. No, they don't. Okay. <laughs> once they're out, they're out. <laughs> Thank you. Those are all the questions I have for Dr. Gagliano. You want those up? Um, yeah, good. Oh, sure. Yep, absolutely. Okay, yep. Dr. Gagliano, so your testimony was that you get records from prior dentists, I guess, and compare them to the uh, the radiographs you get of the postmortem remains, which whatever you're reviewing, right? The state medical examiner's office obtained those records for me. Right. So um, the records that you get from, I'm going to say anti-mortem, from the anti-mortem dentists, uh, safe to say they're only as good as those dentist office operate, right? Yes. That's presuming that they were entered correctly into their system? Correct. 
and just presuming that they took the x-rays or the photographs in an appropriate fashion, right? Correct. Because we're seeing here right now, as you testified earlier, depending on the angle that we're photographing these things or x-raying them, they may look slightly different. Correct. And when you get the records from the ME's office, do you get the actual remains themselves or do you get photographs or x-rays? It depends on the case. In these cases, what have you got? I believe that I went to the medical examiner's office to view the remains, and then I was given the uh, radiographs that were obtained. And you compared the postmortem radiographs with the antemortem records? Yes. And that was what your review was? Yes. So your review is based on the quality of the antemortem record taking and record keeping, as well as the postmortem record taking and record keeping, right? Yes. Assuming nothing's getting mixed up in the in the rush, I don't say the rush, mixed up in the uh, in the fray here. Correct. And you have no way of knowing. I have the comparison. So if there, uh, the medical examiner's office take the radiographs, and if they were to give me mm -hmm. a different mm -hmm. uh, set of radiographs to compare, and they don't compare, that's the only way that I know that those radiographs mm -hmm. aren't a match. But for, for example, you were sent anti-mortem records of uh, alleged to be Veronica Bauchuk, right? Yes. And whether that were, was her record is dependent on the quality of the record keeping by her then dentist, right? Yes. And here you testified when you were doing that review, you said you found two areas of concordance for Ms. Bauchuk. Three, I'm sorry, three areas. including the tooth that had been extracted, consistent with the chart notes that those provided. So you reviewed well, I'll get back up for one second. Is there a some sort of database where you can you can say I've got these remains, I've got fillings on tooth uh, six, eight, and twelve, put it into a system and find all the people with fillings on tooth six, eight, and twelve? The medical investigators do that. Okay. Um, but that's, did you, was that done here? I, I'm not privy to that information. I do not know. Um, but that database search was not done in this case. I don't know if it was or not. Um, it wasn't done by me. It's not what I do. It's something that the medical investigators at the medical examiner's office do. Okay. So you were solely provided a set of records, anti-mortem, a set of records, post-mortem saying, do these compare? Correct. <laughs> And in this case, your testimony was there's three areas of concordance, two fillings, one, uh, in for, sorry, for Veronica Bauchuk. Yes. Three areas of concordance, uh, a restoration on 213, a restoration on 14, and then an extraction on 15. Yes. And you recall your testimony on that. You pointed to the records and showed the jury where those were. Not, not right now. You, not you did. Case. Okay. <laughs> yes, I did. And you testified that 15 had been extracted. Yes. And that was shown in the post-mortem records. Yes. But when you were going through the anti-mortem records in front of the jury here today, you clearly saw tooth 15. Correct. And we were not shown an anti-mortem record, radiograph, x-ray, anything like that. It showed 15 being extracted. No, 15 was present in the anti-mortem radiographs. The only way that I knew that that tooth had been taken out was that the records from the dentist stated that she came in and had that procedure done. Right. And that was a uh that was a, that was a narrative description, right? The narrative of the dentist? Yeah. It was in the chart notes, yes. So narrative, again, not to be glorily here, but using words describing what had been done. Yes. You didn't review any x-rays or radiographs that uh that corroborated that. Meaning that went against that or I'm not sure what or, you're asking or, or agreed with it. The record we saw here today clearly showed tooth 15, right? The anti-mortem record showed tooth 15 in place. The post-mortem showed that it was not there. And you said you have a narrative description that tooth 15 had been extracted. Yes. What the jury saw today was only did not see an x-ray photograph, radiograph, whatever you want to call it of an anti-mortem record showing tooth 15 not being there. Correct. And for Ms. Abouchuk's case as well, you only got the top jaw, right? Correct. Did the mandible was missing. Correct. 
And that means, again, it will, and what you ended up reviewing were essentially eight teeth, right? The teeth that remained in the maxillary dentition, dentition, yes. Out of possible 32 teeth that you, that an adult could have. Yes. In the maxillary dentition, there's 16 teeth. In the lower dentition, the mandibular dentition, there's 16 teeth. So the maximum amount of teeth that were pre- that could have been present were 16. You were unaware whether there were going to be any areas of concordance or disagreement between any tooth on the bottom or the other eight teeth on the top. I did not know because I couldn't. I had nothing to compare. Okay. That's all I have, Judge. Dr. Gregory, you said that earlier that only one, is it level of concordance? What is it called? Area. Area of concordance is required to make a positive identification. Is that correct? Yes. And in each particular, in each case that we've talked about today, you actually identified using three areas of concordance, correct? Yes. Um, And how certain are you? And were there any areas of disagreement in either one of the IDs? No, there were not. How certain are you of your identification of both Ms. Abachuk and Ms. Henry? I am 100% positive. Uh, this dental identification is very accurate and very reliable. And that based on the evidence that I received from the medical examiner's office, that this it this was Veronica Abachuk and this was Kathleen Henry. Thank you. Those are all the questions I have. You're done. You may step down. Thank you. Doctor, please come up here next to me. Morning. Good morning. Remain standing, raise your right hand, and we'll swear you in. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony will give in this case I will report to be the truth? I do. Thank you. Please proceed and please state your name and swear your last name the record. Name is uh, Norman Howard Thompson, T H O M P S O N. Thank you. And Dr. Thompson, I'm going to have you introduce yourself to the jury. Tell them who you are and um, what you did for a living. Um, I uh, am a physician. I uh, worked as a, a medical examiner uh, at various times uh, as a full-time medical examiner. Uh, over the last 50 years, I have been in medical care of various types. I'm a, a pathologist, uh, which means you go to medical school and, and then another five years of training in, in uh, laboratory medicine, essentially. Uh, part of that is learn how to do autopsies. And so um, it's a natural uh, extension to uh, specialize for some people in forensic pathology. And that was the route that I chose. I've uh, worked as a forensic pathologist, uh, did my training in Denver, worked there as well as a forensic pathologist. Um, I've uh, worked as a consultant in forensic pathology in uh, places uh, such as Wyoming. Uh, and I worked up here for uh, about five years as a forensic pathologist from uh, 94 to 99. Uh, and uh, then I took a job as a hospital pathologist in uh, Juneau, Alaska, where I live, um, and was a consultant in forensic pathology uh, for about 25 years in that setting. When I finished my uh, hospital work, I uh, took a year uh, and finished up uh, vesting with the state uh, as a forensic pathologist, also at the medical examiner's office here. And you talked, you know, about your training, your medical degree. What year did you get that degree in? Say again, please. What year did you get your medical degree in? Uh, I received my uh, MD degree in 1984. And you've been practicing in one form or another, as you've described, essentially since then? That's correct. Okay. And when you worked as a forensic pathologist for the state of Alaska conducting autopsies, did you ever do that same work anywhere else? 
Um, yes, um, in Denver um, and in Wyoming. Okay, and approximately how many years do you think you did that work? Um, about two years in Denver, um, and uh, uh, I suppose uh, intermittently it was as a consultant, so uh, three years in Wyoming. Okay. Have you ever had to come to court to testify about um, autopsies that you've performed? Many times. Okay. And have you been qualified as an expert in the field of forensic pathology? Also many times. Okay. In what jurisdictions? Texas, um, Wyoming, uh, Colorado, uh, Alaska. Okay. State and federal court or just state court? Um, at least state court. I've been in a few federal proceedings as well. Okay. Your Honor, at this point, I'd move to qualify Dr. Thompson as an expert in the field of forensic pathology. No objection. Court recognizes him as an expert in that field. Thank you, Your Honor. And I'd like to talk to you today about an autopsy that you performed um, on somebody ultimately identified as Kathleen Henry. Um, when was that examination completed? Um, it was... Uh, Initial late. examination. When was the initial? The initial okay. examination was performed on the third of October in uh, 2019. Okay. And can you describe the remains as they came to the medical examiner's office? The medical exam uh, examiner's office uh, received the remains uh, in a, uh, uh, a thick uh, plastic yellow body bag, which was labeled uh, "human remains." Um, and uh, indicated uh, the location uh, as uh, Indian, which is uh, in the area of Indian Valley, for those that are familiar with the uh, road system to Seward. Um, those remains, when we uh, opened the bag, were accompanied by a, uh, a biohazard bag, a red plastic bag, in which uh, some articles uh, were found, including uh, a, a sizable amount of scalp hair, uh, with a tiny amount of uh, of uh, skin attached, um, and then uh, the skeletal remains. Um, and the skeletal remains were um, uh, basically uh, received uh, with some attached tissue, um, but it was obviously a, a human skeleton. Uh, they were uh, the remains were were folded such that the the uh, the hips were flexed, which is another way of saying that um, the legs were bent towards the torso uh, and the feet were more or less in the region of the head. Okay. And when you receive the remains, what's the first thing that happens to them? Well, the first thing that happens is, a, is a, an attempt to uh, uh, understand what uh, police investigation or investigative details are available. Um, and uh, the first um, step really in any death investigation is to try to understand who you're dealing with. So an identification effort. Uh, in this case, I don't think the remains were initially identified. And so my uh, efforts were to describe characteristics that might be matched with a missing persons report. Um, so things like uh, uh, an estimate of height from uh, a calculation based on the length of the large thigh bone or the femur. Um, so I was able to estimate the height was around five feet. Um, and uh, long, uh, dark hair, some of the, of the long, dark hair was uh, uh, attached still to the uh, skull, um, but it matched the uh, hair that we found in the, in the plastic bag, which accompanied the body to the medical examiner's office. That hair was approximately uh, 23 inches in length, so very long. Um, the uh, examination of the body also revealed uh, the presence of teeth. Um, usually in a setting like this, the uh, uh, remains, uh, the body bag essentially is x-rayed uh, in an attempt to look for foreign material. That could include bellet fragments if any are present or uh, uh, metal objects maybe. Um, uh, a thesis, a knee uh, implant, or something of that sort. So you're looking for hardware um, or foreign material to help understand how the individual died, but also to try to help understand who this individual is. Um, in that process, it was clear that there were 
uh, numerous dental uh, repairs, um, fillings, if you will. Uh, and so uh, it seemed likely that uh, uh, by e examining the teeth, a, uh, a professional who specializes in identifying people by um, dental uh, features could perhaps identify uh, the body. That, of course, would require uh, the presence of a, a dental record or a dental exam that had taken place when the, when the uh, uh, person was alive. Uh, and so um, after uh, initiating uh, that uh, documentation of, of dental um, repairs, um, and identifying characteristics, looking for obvious uh, injuries, that sort of thing. Um, then the next step um, in skeletal remains really is uh, to uh, try to understand what evidence you can detect from looking at the bones. Um, it's well known from uh, archaeology uh, that it, uh, bones can preserve uh, evidence of of tool marks or knife cuts um, literally for thousands of years. Uh, and so uh, my uh, job in this case would be to carefully look at the surfaces of the bone uh, for evidence that might help uh, understand if a, an object uh, or a tool was used, for instance, in, uh, in striking the individual, uh, if there's a, a typical uh, injury to the bone, which could help explain um, death, like a skull fracture or something of that sort. So basically, my my job was to uh, uh, clean up the skeleton, uh, look for any evidence that again would would help identify the person, uh, might indicate a cause or a manner of death, uh, and that process was fairly lengthy. It took place over uh, over several days, really. Uh, and included. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna stop you and talk about that process in just a minute. Okay, very well. But um, you talked about like the means of identifying somebody. Is dental record something that is a common tool of your trade? Oh, very common. Okay, is it well understood to be um, a reliable source of human identification? Um, especially in cases where. Uh, Fingerprints aren't uh, available for uh, whatever reason, plane crashes or, or burning or something of that sort. Dental um, identification is a, uh, a gold standard for understanding who the individual is. Of course, it requires previous records. It requires an expert to uh, judge whether those records match the, the decedent. Um, and uh, in that setting, um, it is is. Um, uniformly accepted in the United States as a uh, as a definite ID or a definitive ID. Okay, and in this case, was the body decomposed to a degree that fingerprints weren't going to be an option to send? Um, there, were, there were a number of reasons. Um, uh, there are occasionally cases of, of of remains that are decomposed where fingerprints can be obtained, but in this case, there was no chance to obtain any fingerprints. Okay. Did that have to do both with the level of decomposition as well as predation? That's exactly right. Okay. Um, predation is a word I use for uh, either insects or animals, which may remove uh, parts of a, de of a deceased body. Okay. And so did you have those um, dental records sent to a forensic odontologist named Dr. Gagliano? That is correct. Okay. And did the medical examiner's office also collect what's called anti-mortem um, records for a Kathleen Joe Henry? Yes. Okay. And were those submitted to Dr. Gagliano? Um, yes, that was part of the dental identification process. And who was the, who did you determine from that um, consulting with Dr. Gagliano was the, was the decedent in front of you? Uh, Kathleen Henry. And so I'd like to talk then about the process you were going to start going into with the jury about what you do to, I guess, prepare the skeleton to look at it, to, to do that examination that you talked about to help determine a cause and manner of death. Very well. In most uh, autopsies, um, the examination is uh, um, starts by looking at the skin surface. Uh, obviously, if a bullet or a stab wound um, goes through the skin, you have a marker at the surface. In a situation where the skin uh, or the underlying tissue is absent, um, then it's uh, necessary to look at the bones um, and, and those bones may be examined closely, but um, typically um, 
tissue, membranes, um, uh, tendons, and that sort of thing, which are more resistant to uh, uh, removal, may stay attached. Uh, and so the process uh, that is typically used is to uh, uh, use a, a, a detergent, if you will, to loosen the tissue on the bones and then uh, remove the tissue from the bones um, and uh, or clean it. And, and typically that's done with um, uh, paper towels or some soft um, uh, uh, cloth uh, in order to remove the tissue um, and not leave marks on the on the bones, uh, which could happen if, for instance, you use a, a knife or something to scrape the, the bones. Um, and so by um, using a, a, a detergent or soap that has some enzymes in it, it helps uh, digest away some of the uh, tissue and makes it easier to remove and examine the underlying bones for evidence of, of stab wounds or, or other um, marks that may, be, may have been left on this. Okay. Did you find any evidence consistent with, say, a stab wound or say a bullet striking a bone? There was no such evidence. Uh, I might add that the x-rays uh, were carefully looked at for evidence of bullet fragments. Typically when a bullet strikes a bone, it fragments into multiple small pieces, um, a term that is sometimes used as a snowstorm. So the bullet fragments can be distributed widely. Those are usually pretty easily seen on x-ray uh, and there were no evidence, there's no evidence of uh, bullet fragments on the x-ray examination. And um, did you, were you able after you, you did your examination to determine a cause and manner of death? The examination um, revealed no uh, obvious uh, injuries that would have been sufficient to cause death. Another way of saying that is that the, uh, the uh, exa post-mortem examination did not show uh, injuries uh, that would explain um, somebody's uh, death in this situation. Okay. Were you able to, to finalize a cause and manner of death for, um, for your report, regardless of that? Yes. And what did you um, ascertain was the cause and manner of death? And then we'll talk to, about how you got there. Um, very good. I, uh, the cause and manner of death, uh, I'm reading from my report, uh, is asphyxiation. I'm sorry, asphyxiation due to strangulation. Okay. How did you get there? Um, basically, uh, in the uh, examination of the body, no uh, obvious alternative causes of death uh, were found. Um, there was uh, insufficient tissue really to allow for a, a toxicology examination. Um, and that's just to look for poisons or drugs or something like that. Um, but in any case, none of, uh, none of the tissues were uh, essentially lending themselves to such an exam. Um, and so, um, as is typically the case in uh, cases of uh, initially unexplained death, uh, we rely heavily on a police investigation to uh, help understand the situation or conditions in which an individual has, uh, has come to die uh, or come to be found um, in a suspicious uh, situation. So, uh, typically, the police and the medical examiner work um, uh, pretty closely to coordinate what can be learned from the body and what can be learned from scene or police investigation. Okay. And in the course of that um, consult, did you review a series of videos depicting essentially a strangulation? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. And I want you to talk to the jury just a little bit as a physician about um, when somebody is strangled, what happens in the body that causes death and how that can occur. Um, typically, uh, strangulation uh, is a, is a uh, fairly broad uh, term. It is kind of an emotionally charged term. But fundamentally, um, the, the brain, uh, which is uh, sort of essential to uh, keep alive in order to keep somebody from dying. Sorry for the clumsiness of that statement. But fundamentally, the brain needs a steady supply of nutrients, which include uh, uh, glucose, sugar, that sort of thing. But most importantly, uh, the body, the brain needs a constant supply of oxygen. Um, and so if the uh, blood supply uh, by say compression uh, of the arteries or veins that supply blood to the brain uh, is interrupted, uh, 
and that can be due to compression or in an extreme uh, case, uh, an incision can cause somebody to bleed out from a from a cut throat. But fundamentally, compression of the of the uh, blood vessels that supply the brain uh, will render unconsciousness fairly quickly, uh, usually within seconds or minutes, uh, and death uh, usually within minutes. Um, and that is a uh, a complete obstruction. Um, you can uh, understand that pretty easily from a mechanical uh, perspective um, by imagining a, a ligature uh, hanging uh, a, a rope or something in which somebody's body weight is suspended. Um, and that rope presses against the neck, interrupts blood flow to the brain and can cause unconsciousness and, and death from, from asphyxiation. Other ways to do that um, are to um, uh, use, for instance, a hand to compress the blood vessels. If that is done, um, Effectively and thoroughly, you get the same effect on consciousness and eventual death. Um, other uh, mechanisms can uh, uh, um, cause the same effects. Um, uh, body weight or a head uh, pressed into, say, the fork of a TV stand is a case I remember seeing from early on in my training, was sufficient to obstruct blood flow to the brain and cause death. So. Um, an outside obstructing uh, force um, can cause death. There are other mechanisms which can contribute to that. For instance, if the uh, chest is compressed and it's not possible to inhale and ex expand the chest, that can contribute um, in, a, in a case like this. But the most fundamental uh, way to understand uh, an asphyxial death is an interruption of, of blood flow uh, to the brain. It's also true that if one um, presses hard on the uh, neck and compresses um, the trachea, uh, the trachea is the windpipe, if that gets pushed into a closed position, it would be as if you couldn't inhale and that can uh, uh, produce a, a panicky sensation if conscious, um, but it again can restrict oxygen supply to the brain, which can cause unconsciousness and death. So is it fair to say you need both blood and oxygen to the brain and cutting off either of those things could cause death? That is correct. And cutting off both of them certainly would cause death. Yes. Okay. Um, and based on the videos that you reviewed and the skeletal remains that you reviewed, you came to a cause and manner of death of asphyxiation? Uh, yes. By homicide? Um, correct. Okay. And do you have to, when you make that finding and put it in your report in the final um, diagnosis, do you have to have a certain degree of um, medical certainty in order to say that? Well, um, yes. It, it is uh, in general um, uh, true that the uh, uh, final uh, aspect of the autopsy is preparation of the report. It includes consideration of all the factors that are known at the time that the report is completed. Um, and uh, it is uh, to a, a fair degree of medical certainty um, that this conclusion is based. Um, as I might uh, add, although the skeletal remains, uh, if isolated, uh, make this deciding the cause of death somewhat challenging, uh, in the presence of uh, video documentation of an assault capable of causing death, um, the conclusion, I think, in the autopsy report is quite justified. Um, asphyxiation due to strangulation is my opinion. Okay. And that's particularly in light of no other alternative explanations based on the skeletal remains? Well, certainly other explanations were looked for and not found. Um, that's part of the process. By not finding anything else, um, it left. Um, by a process of elimination, um, including the things that are definitely a factor. Okay. I'm going to show you what's been marked for identification as state's exhibits 294 through 298. Um, during the autopsy process, are photographs taken? Yes, it's, it's one of the important ways to document the work that you do during an <laughs> autopsy. Uh, and so they are routinely taken. Sometimes the police will take photographs and my um, staff at the time was... Uh, uh, would take photographs in order to document uh, my findings and the and the state of the examination. Okay, in front of you, I have a series <laughs> of exhibits 294 through 298. 
and they're front and back. So if you look at 294, 295 mm -hmm. is, should be on the back side of it. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go through them in a minute. Just go ahead well. and look over them all generally really quick. So I can ask you, are these all photographs and or images that were taken at the medical examiner's office um, for this case? Yes. Okay. I'd move at this point for the admission of state's exhibits 294 through 298, and then we'll talk about them in turn. No objection. They're admitted. And um, while we're getting the slideshow up behind you, um, thank you, officer. While we're getting the slideshow up behind you, tell the jury kind of overall what is 294. Exhibit 294 uh, is a uh, uh, photograph of the skeletal remains uh, of uh, <coughs> Kathleen Henry. Uh, this uh, appears to be um, in the preliminary examination uh, stage. Um, so there's still uh, a fair amount of tissue adherent uh, to the body, but shows the pieces that were recovered. Um, skull, neck, uh, chest, uh, uh, spine in the region of the abdomen, pelvis, uh, thigh bones, uh, and leg bones. Uh, in this uh, uh, photograph, um, the, uh, the digits or the, the fingers are uh, partially or completely removed. Uh, that's also true of the of the feet. Um, those are pieces that are uh, likely, uh, in my experience, to be removed incident to or uh, caused by uh, animal predation. Um, in this area, uh, one could imagine um, uh, uh, bears, small animals, uh, dogs, uh, something like that, that uh, could come to a body and remove them. Also, uh, birds are, are likely to be um, contributors to the to this kind of uh, skeletonization uh, of human remains. Sure. And Dr. Thompson, somebody untrained might look at this and say, man, that's a lot of decomposition for just a month. Can you talk about the factors that um, lead to decomposition and whether you have an opinion about whether this is consistent with that time frame? Um, it's... It's true that decomposition um, uh, occurs at different rates under different conditions. Uh, typically, uh, if a body is buried in, in snow or ice, they may uh, remain well preserved for um, even years. Um, but when a body is exposed uh, at ambient temperature in the, uh, in the fall uh, or late summer uh, in Alaska, uh, the appearance of uh, insect uh, and animal um, uh, predation activities, essentially they uh, show up to take advantage of this food source and, um, and carry away uh, elements, uh, which can include the soft tissue organs uh, uh, and muscle uh, tissues. Um, and, and that process is uh, uh, well understood uh, and within the time frame that I'm looking at, um, as I understand it, um, this kind of skeletization, skeletonization is completely consistent with the interval of time uh, that is described between the time of uh, death or placement of the body outdoors uh, and the time it was found. Okay. So this is consistent with death in early September being found in early October knowing that the body was outside yes, on I've, an embankment and turning an arm. I've seen a number of um, bodies that were reduced to this state in less time than this um, in, uh, in Alaska in, in the summer, uh, and um, that would extend into the early fall. Okay. And when you talk about like evidence of predation that you saw, we talked before about like fingerprints and the ability to get those specifically, what did you see on like the hands or extremities that, that tells you that predation has occurred? Um, basically removal of, uh, uh, of the distal uh, parts of the fingers. I, that's a, a doctor word for the, for the ends or the tips, if you will, of the fingers. Most of those uh, bits have been, uh, have been removed. Um, Typically, um, the uh, body as it decomposes, the tissues that kind of hold it together and give it um, structure and strength um, deteriorate. Um, 
decompose or um, to use a, a, a more vulgar term, they rot, they get soft and then animals uh, uh, may uh, pull off uh, loosely attached uh, digits just because they have a tendency to grab uh, small portable uh, parts of the body and carry it away and, and consume it elsewhere. Um, also, uh, the soft tissues of the, uh, of the legs, that's the muscles of the legs and arms uh, are uh, desirable parts for the, for the, uh, for the animal predators. Um, and all this is uh, accelerated as well by uh, the activities of uh, uh, insects um, and insect larvae. Um, and so uh, in this case, I looked forward, found uh, numerous uh, uh, insect larvae. Uh, uh, the, the correct uh, term for that uh, is uh, maggot, if you will. So, so fly larvae uh, land quickly in a, in, a, uh, in a death in this kind of setting and actively uh, uh, burrow into the tissues, soften it, uh, and digest it. And, and that accelerates the this, this softening, if you will, uh, and, and makes removal of parts of the body by other uh, predators, easy uh, birds, as I said, and dogs and that sort of thing. And another thing I wanted to talk to you about, you said the hair that was brought in with the body was in a red biohazard bag. Is that um, visible in this photograph? Yes, there is uh, uh, the uh, red biohazard bag, typically um, in the collection of evidence. Um, body parts tend to be kept together by the investigating officers and the medical examiner's um, staff. And in this case, uh, they found uh, a, uh, a large collection of what appeared to be scalp hair um, and some other items um, and, and placed it into a red plastic bag to preserve the evidence. And it's a, it's a typical biohazard bag, um, uh, but comes off a roll and is clean and sterile and useful for protecting evidence. Okay. And I don't think we selected some of those photographs for the jury, but inside that biohazard bag, did you measure and describe the hair? Yes, I did. Um, what was the length and color of that hair? Um, I'm going to double check just to be sure I give you the precise um, amount. If it'll refresh your recollection, I'm looking at page two of your um, inspection report. You bet. Um, 26 inches was the measured length of a strand that I kind of teased out of the tangled um, hair. Uh, and it was typical of the, of, the, of the remainder of the hair in terms of degree of, of curliness, if you will, color and that sort of thing. Um, also- um, And did you say it was, what were the physical characteristics of it besides the length? Uh, It was basically uh, straight uh, and black, a little bit of, uh, of uh, I don't want to say curl, but, but it was a little bit wavy, but that could have been an, um, an artifact, if you will, of, of its placement in the bag and that sort of thing. Sure. And you described it as apparently straight black hair, right? Yes. Um, um, the other element is that um, while one could make an argument, if this was found remote from the body, it might not belong to the body. There was a patch of hair that was attached to the skull, um, and, and that matched this hair in terms of uh, characteristics. Okay. And then the other thing that you've mentioned already, I just wanted to kind of drill down in. You talked about a height of, approx or of about five feet. Is that an approximate, and how did you get that? It's very much an approximation. Um, at the time that I uh, made that estimate, it was not, not known um, who the individual was. Uh, and so, in order to uh, Make that estimate, uh, one can measure the length of the thigh bone or the femur bone um, in centimeters. And then there's a standard calculation you can apply um, that estimates from length of femur, how tall an individual would be. And uh, basically the calculation revealed um, that the likely height was uh, 60 inches or five feet um, plus an inch and a half or minus an inch and a half. So around five feet is a good uh, estimate. Um, obviously, if there was a, uh, uh, an identification card, which had an estimate of height, that might be a little bit better number to use. Um, but in this case, it gives uh, uh, investigators uh, an opportunity to, to know um, if 
they're looking for missing person reports to identify somebody, what size range we're looking at. And then I wanted to go through just a few more pictures. If you look at um, 295 and 296, before I put them up on the screen, are those both photographs of the skull? Yes. And do you think that they, um, I suppose, are good depictions of just the overall quality of the dentition and how many teeth this the skeletal, these skeletal remains had? Um, yes, this is a um, good representation of, of the teeth. You can see a few. Uh, dental repairs or fillings, um, even in this setting. Um, and there's still uh, a fair amount of the uh, attached um, soft tissue. Um, that, that would be... Uh, um, Is that in 295? Uh, that is uh, both in 295 and 296. But the teeth are well illustrated and attached to the jaw. Sometimes in, uh, in decomposed bodies, uh, the tooth can become loose in the sockets and fall out, um, but these are still attached and so they're in the same place that they would be in uh, in life. Uh, and it's important to, to document um, by x-ray uh, what state they're in as, as quickly as possible. So in case one falls out, you don't lose that data point. Okay. And I wanna talk about some of the x-rays that you um, your office took. On 297, what are these two images? Uh, 297 is a uh, 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 an X-ray uh, of the mandible, which is the jawbone. Um, I'm indicating my own uh, uh, jawbone region uh, with my finger, um, and uh, the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone. Oh, you can see it. I'll indicate it. Uh, its location on the on the screen behind me. Um, it has a uh, roughly C shape or reverse C shape in this. In this thing, in, in this image, and then you can see a sort of a gray uh, area here. The hyoid bone um, is uh, similar in size to a chicken wishbone and can be fractured perhaps as easily. Um, and in this case, uh, the hyoid bone is located in the neck, usually pretty high in the neck, uh, as part of uh, uh, a biological mechanism to help keep the the uh, uh, airways or the uh, uh, windpipe open. Um, and if uh, an individual sustains pressure or force to the neck, sometimes uh, this hyoid bone can be broken. Uh, it's a useful marker of trauma um, to the neck sometimes. Uh, it's uh, in this case, uh, this gray area uh, shouldn't be viewed as a, uh, a fracture. It's uh, what is a normal variant in younger women. Uh, and younger uh, people in general, which is a, uh, it's a flexible cartilaginous, um, and cartilage is just a soft tissue that's kind of rubbery. Um, and, and so it's a normal variant um, to have uh, this bone not calcified, not uh, uh, rigidly in this uh, reverse C shape that you can see here. Uh, so this bone was carefully examined for evidence of fracture. Uh, no evidence of fracture was found. Um, and that um, is, uh, is of interest um, forensically because it, it, uh, if present, the fracture would be a marker of, uh, of force applied to the neck. Uh, if absent, it doesn't help exclude strangulation uh, because in many cases where uh, strangulation, uh, where death by strangulation is a certainty that hyoid bone um, has been uh, protected or is not broken. So it's not being broken doesn't uh, take away from my conclusion that this is a, an asphyxial death from strangulation. Okay, to rephrase that another way, have you seen asphyxiations with completely intact hyoid bones? Um, yes. Okay, and so it is possible to strangle somebody to death without breaking that bone? Um, yes. Okay, and is that in part because of what you described, the cutting off of blood flow on essentially the side of your neck? Well, that could certainly happen. Um, how, how else can it happen? Um, well, the, the, uh, the hyoid bone is somewhat protected because it's high, uh, sort of uh, protected, if you will, by the jawbone. So if the force is applied uh, below the hyoid bone, you won't get any uh, fracture or injury to the hyoid bone. Um, and uh, compression of the blood vessels on the side or even in the front of the neck uh, is really the central 
uh, issue and cutting off blood supply to the brain. Okay. So if the hyoid bone were fractured, it's obvious that there was trauma to the neck, correct? Uh, correct. And to have it not fractured could still mean that that trauma existed. It just didn't, just didn't fracture the bone. Objective leading. Sustained. Um, I, want, I just want to rephrase that in the most simple way possible for the jury. Can you, can you, does the absence of a fracture to the hyoid bone discount strangulation as a cause of death? No. Okay. Um, let's go to 298. You talked about um, communicating with the forensic odontologist. Are these the um, postmortem? dental x-rays that were taken and sent to Dr. Gagliano? Um, yes. Okay. And she's already testified about these, but um, have you sent more to dental x-rays with less teeth and still gotten an identification back from an odontologist? Objection of relevance. Overruled. Um, yes. Um, typically one... Um, I, I trust the science of the odontologists to know how, how much is enough to make a definite ID. But certainly in my experience, uh, looking at the number of fillings uh, present here, um, if pre-existing uh, or living dental records exist, I would be very comfortable that there's enough evidence uh, present to match those. Okay. And comfortable enough that you notated Kathleen Henry as the decedent on your autopsy report? Absolutely. Okay. That's all the questions I have for you. Dr. Thompson, <clears throat> so you perform, you were originally asked in this case to review the medical the sorry the skeletal remains that were collected on the side of the sewer highway correct yes and you did review those remains i did and you produced a report detailing your findings regarding those remains right that is correct and in that report you noted i'm sorry do you have a copy of it with you i do in that report on the last page uh page seven you note there is no evidence of significant or potentially mortal injury to the bony skeletal remains of the decedent right that is correct because all the soft tissue had been uh, decomposed away or you know, predated away, and all you had left were the bones, and there was nothing medically significant in the bones to tell you how this person may have died. That is correct. So the person <clears throat> could have suffered a, an injury to their soft tissue, could have killed them, and you wouldn't have any evidence of that, right? That is correct. The person could have died of an overdose, and you have no evidence to... Uh, of that, right? Um, I have no evidence from which I could conclude that there was an overdose. Right. In fact, in your report, you note on the first page, no specimen suitable for toxicology testing or recovery at postmortem examination. Right? That is correct. Meaning this person could have overdosed and you not have any evidence of that whatsoever. Um, at the autopsy examination, no evidence of an overdose. Uh, so in reviewing the skeletal remains, Looking at the skeleton itself, you could not come to any medical conclusions as to a cause of death. Um, by restricting my um, observations to the skeleton, that is correct. Right. And, and back to this report, you did draft a seven page report in this case, right? That is correct. Uh, where you detailed uh, an external examination, including identification, um, how the remains came to you initially, right? Correct. You did a preliminary x-ray and you note that, right? Correct. You reviewed the entire body, the clothing, right? Um, I, there, there was no clothing that uh, accompanied the body, but, but yes. there's a section of your report noting that specifically under clothing, right? Uh, specifically, page. my report notes the absence of clothing. Uh, you did an entire skeletal examination, literally head to toe. Um, yes. And you detail that on pages three, four, five, and into page six of your report. Yes. And then you uh, you note at the end that you cleaned the skeleton 
defleshed it and you wrote about that process as well? Yes, I did. And you finished with uh, a review of the skeleton after it had, been, it had been cleaned, correct? And then at the end of the report on page seven, you know, conclusion you read before, there's no evidence of significant or potentially mortal injury to the bony skeletal remains of the deceased, right? That is correct. That was your entire medical review of the remains in this case. Yes. That wasn't all you were asked to do, was it? You were also asked to come up with the cause of death, right? Yeah, that's part of the medical examiner's uh, mandate is to cause. And, and uh, for that, you had to go beyond the medical review of the remains to come up with the cause of death, right? Yes. In that you viewed some videos. Yes. And you do not detail any medical or medically significant findings in your report about those videos, right? I did not. Uh, you simply say, number one, investigative digital videographic evidence of strangulation, right? Yes. And that's the entirety of the basis of your diagnosis of death by strangulation. Yes. And there is one piece of evidence you would look for in a skeleton to confirm whether the person had been manually strangled. And that was the hyoid bone that you mentioned before, right? Yes. And the medically significant finding would be the hyoid bone being broken, right? That could be helpful, yes. Uh, and in fact, if the hyoid bone were broken, it would be medical confirmation of death by strangulation that you would have viewed in a video. It would be supportive evidence, yes. And as you discussed before, there's different types of strangulation and there's different ways you can die by death, by, die by strangulation. That is correct. Um, one would be if the hands are on the side of the neck, correct? Um, yes. And that would put no pressure on the front of the neck, so you wouldn't expect the bone to be broken at that point. Um, if it was, if the hands were applied uh, below the level of the how you're going, that could be correct. Well, we'll get there. Right now, I'm talking about the side of the neck. Uh -huh. You wouldn't expect pressure on the side of the neck necessarily to break that bone. Uh, I would not. You would also, as you just said, not expect any pressure below the hyoid bone to break the bone, right? Correct. But pressure where the hyoid bone would be higher up on the neck, you would expect, or you, you would expect at that point the bone could be broken. It could be, yes. And that takes some amount of force, right? Some. And you liken that to breaking the wishbone of a chicken. Correct. Which is something you can do with your children or grandchildren at Thanksgiving, right? Um, well, it'd be a turkey, but yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Touche. Sorry. <clears throat> um, but that bone here was not broken, right? I, I, it was not broken. And you viewed opinion. the videos in this case to come to your conclusion of cause of death. That is correct. And in this case, you viewed the video where there was pressure put by manual hand strangulation onto the neck. So I don't recall times, right? specifically, I do remember the video that I reviewed was um, some years ago. Um, and uh, it was as a component of an investigation. Um, and as that uh, investigative component, um, my examination of the video um, helped me conclude that the investigative conclusion was, was correct. Um, and uh, as is often the case um, in a medical examiner case, uh, the investigation helps determine the cause and manner of death and is used in that way. So you were simply confirming, the police said, we think that this person may have died by manual strangulation. You said, makes sense to me. Yes. But in your medical review of it, you found nothing to corroborate that. Um, yes. So back to what my question had been, which is how much of the videos did you view? Um, I don't recall specifically. I do remember seeing uh, enough to help me conclude that, that uh, substantial force uh, was recorded as having been applied to the neck in a way that could uh, induce asphyxial death or strangulation. And substantial force applied to the neck could be sufficient to break the hyoid bone, right? It could. Uh, putting a foot to somebody's neck could be enough to break the hyoid bone, right? Um, it could in the correct position. Uh, putting a wire on somebody's neck and squeezing it as hard as you can could be enough to break it, right? Um, in some circumstances, depends on the placement of the wire. So it doesn't sound like you reviewed the video to determine whether the force 
apparent in the video would have been sufficient to or expected to break the hyoid bone? Uh, I did not. You were also reviewing, sorry, also in reviewing the police investigation, you are relying on the police's identification of the person in the video, right? Um, that would be important, yes. That the person I, in the video and, was the same person as the remains that you are examining. That is correct. Then. If it were different people, then review, reviewing the video would not inform the cause of death of the skeleton you're reviewing at all, right? That is correct. That's all I have mentioned. You were talking on direct about how the hyoid bone is protected. Can you explain that again? Um, the uh, jaw, and I'll use my own hand as, a, as an example, uh, uh, is approximately in this location. The hyoid bone uh, is above uh, the, uh, the windpipe uh, and somewhat behind uh, the jawbone. So it's in a relatively protected position if force is applied to the neck in uh, what, in my experience, has been the typical position that uh, is is grabbed or held onto in a in a uh, strangulation homicide. And um, in reviewing the video, did you see enough to conclude that the pressure applied mm -hmm. would be sufficient to kill somebody? I did. Okay, and you made that determination regardless of the findings of um, the hyoid bone in your examination. Uh, correct. In, in a sense, the hyoid bone, from my perspective, uh, is important because another uh, forensic pathologist um, who looks at my work uh, would expect me to examine the hyoid bone um, carefully. Uh, and so part of my uh, autopsy report was to document that I, that I did that good job of looking at the hyoid bone carefully. And that would be helpful to prove strangulation, but not necessary? Um, Perhaps helpful, yes. Um, it's not necessary. Uh, many individuals who are known to have been strangled have intact uh, or unbroken hyoid bones. And you've seen that throughout your career beginning back in 1984? Many times. Okay, that's all that I have. Good job, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, please. Up here next to me, please, ma'am. This is Kara Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Please remain standing, raise your right hand, and we'll swear you in. If you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you will give in the case now before this court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Please receive them. Please state your name and spell your last name. Here. My name is My name is Kara Greger, and my last name is spelled G R E G O R. Thank you. And Ms. Greger, can I have you introduce yourself to the jury? Tell them who you are and where you work. I am a forensic examiner in the DNA casework unit at the FBI laboratory located in Quantico, Virginia. Tell them a little bit about the training that you have to do that job. So I have approximately 27 months of extensive training to perform uh, what a forensic examiner does. And what I do basically is I'm managing a case when it's received at the FBI laboratory in the DNA casework unit. And I'm determining what items to test and what tests to perform on those items. I then will direct a team of biologists to perform those tests in the laboratory. And then once their lab work is complete, I will review the results. And then after that, I will interpret the data and I will write a report that outlines my conclusions and sometimes testify in court to those conclusions. Okay. And I wanted to talk to you, um, backing up kind of before that, even a little bit about the training and experience you have to get that job. 
Um, what was your undergraduate and um, any postgraduate work? What were those degrees in? So I have a Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry and molecular biology with a minor in chemistry from the University of Massachusetts. And what year did you obtain that degree? In May of uh, 2006. Did you do any postgraduate work? No. And did you, um, what jobs in that field have you had prior to working for the FBI at Quantico? So prior to working at the FBI laboratory, I worked very briefly at Bodie Selmark Forensics, which is located in Lorton, Virginia. And I worked in their DNA uh, unit as well. And prior to that, I worked at the Massachusetts State Police Crime Laboratory for approximately six years in their DNA unit, as well as the Crime Scene Response Unit. Okay. And then how long have you been with the FBI? I've been with the FBI laboratory since April of 2016. So this coming April will be approximately eight years. Okay. And in either of those jobs at Bodie Selmark, at Massachusetts State Police Crime Lab, or the FBI, have you been called upon to testify in court about your examinations and results? Yes, I have. I've testified previously uh, 43 times, uh, 42 of them for nuclear uh, DNA or serology, um, and then one time for crime scene investigation. And have you been qualified as an expert um, by either state or federal courts? Yes, for both. Okay, and in what fields? In nuclear DNA analysis um, and or serology. At this point, Your Honor, I would move to qualify Ms. Gregor as an expert in the field of nuclear DNA analysis and serology. Okay. The court recognizes her as an expert in that field. Let's talk about how you got involved um, in this case. Um, how do samples in the lab come to you? Let's let's start there. Please. So evidence is submitted uh, to the FBI laboratory. And once it gets submitted, um, the evidence management unit will go through the items that were received and uh, talk with the investigator of the case to determine what examinations are needed for what disciplines um, that we offer at the FBI uh, laboratory for testing. So if there are items that are going to need DNA uh, specific uh, testing, and then those items get sent to our unit. And then from there, a DNA examiner will be assigned a case. Okay. And I'm going to hand you some exhibits, 299 through 303. I will start with 299 and 300 to begin with. Um, and these are kind of front and back. So 299 and 300. What are... Um, with 299 and 300 list the items that you were asked to examine? Yes. And um, are those fairly and accurately lifted from your report? Yes. Okay. I'd move at this point for the admission of 299 and 300. No objection. Admitted. May I have a question? Yes. Um, so there's two exhibits there, 299 and 300. Did you actually um, do those at two separate times? Yes. Tell the jury about that. Like, what were you examining first when you get 299? So for exhibit 299, um, these are the samples that were submitted to the FBI laboratory for DNA testing and or serology testing. And uh, this was submitted in May of 2020. And these items, um, once I received them, I took a look at what was received and determined what tests to perform on these items. The date above says October 26, 2020. Is that the date of your report? Yes. Okay. So you get them in May. You ultimately issue a report in um, October. What items were you asked to, to test when you got them in May? So, so the items um, that I was asked to test is the bone from Kathleen Henry, which is item one. 
I also tested item three, which was a buckle sample from Brian Smith. I also tested item four, which is a buckle sample from Stephanie Bisland. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there and we'll go through each of these. Why do you look at a bone? So for a bone, uh, this can be used uh, to determine an individual's a, a DNA profile. And then items three and four, what is a buckle swab? So a buckle swab is essentially a cheek swab. Um, you can think of it as a Q-tip or um, that you would swab the inside of one's cheek to get uh, cheek cells. And that would be to collect a known DNA sample um, from that individual. Okay, so the police have swabbed those and given them to, to the FBI lab. What is item five? I item five is a blanket. Okay, and it does it have a particularly particular like APD tag number on it? Yes, the APD item number is 1227799. Okay, and then item six, seven, and eight, what are those? So for items six, seven, and eight, those are carpet samples. Okay, and I'll, I'll show you some here in a minute, but what are the numbers associated with six, seven, and eight? So for item six, um, which is a carpet sample, this was 1B15 and EPARD code number 6422696. And it was the same 1B number and EPARD code number for items seven and eight. I guess my question is who gives them those numbers? Where do those numbers come from? Those are the FBI laboratory numbers. Okay. So when the evidence comes in, the FBI assigns those numbers to the, to the carpet. Yes. Okay. And was the carpet cut essentially into three sections? Yes, there was uh, three sections of carpet um, that were sent into the FBI laboratory and they were each given an individual item number. Okay. And what then are items 9, 10, and 11? So item 9 is two swabs from the tailgate. And then item 10 is two swabs from the tailgate. And then item 11 is a swab from the truck bed. Okay. And so what were you asked to do initially? And do each of those really quickly have unique APD tags or identifiers on them? They do. Okay. So the swabs from the truck bed are identified differently as the swabs from the tailgate. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Now, um, what were you asked to do with these initial group of items? So I was asked to perform a serology testing and or DNA testing on these items. Okay. And with the bone from Kathleen Joe Henry, were you able to develop a DNA profile? Yes, a DNA profile was developed uh, from this item uh, and that was used for comparisons in the case. Okay. And is it fair to say then that you took items one, three, and four? So Kathleen Henry's then DNA profile, the swab for Mr. Smith, the swab for Ms. Bisland, and compare them against the other items in the in the case. Yes. So what I do is I will take the known DNA profiles that are submitted from individuals and compare them to the evidence DNA profiles or unknown DNA profiles from the items of evidence that are submitted. And then um, exhibit 300, what is exhibit 300? Because an electronic request for item 10, when did you get that information? Uh, this was uh, received in uh, 2021. Um, the request was to take a DNA profile from a Veronica Abichuk and compare it to the evidence DNA profiles in the case. Okay. So to take Ms. Abichuk's DNA profile and compare it to the items listed then on um, the item listed on 299, the blanket, the carpets, the truck swab bed, the truck bed swaps. Yes. Okay. And where did the DNA profile from Ms. Abichuk come from? It came from the University of North Texas uh, Health Science Center. Okay. And Dr. Rolf already testified about um, the remains going there, but is that a common way for you to get, um, I suppose, a DNA profile from an otherwise unidentified person? 
Yes, uh, we can receive uh, profiles that have been developed by other laboratories, uh, and we can use those for comparisons to items uh, in a case. Okay. And so that's typically something you would rely on? Yes, if there is something um, that needs to be compared and a profile was developed from an individual at another laboratory, we can use that um, to perform the comparisons uh, to the items of evidence. And so I want to talk about Exhibit 301. It's a photograph of, do you have it in front of you? Yes. Okay, what is it? So this is a picture of the blanket that was received uh, for testing, which is item five. And is that a fair and accurate um, photo of the blanket that was taken by the FBI Crime Laboratory before testing? Yes, this was taken by one of the biologists who works on the items in the laboratory. And does that become part of your report to help show where, um, where stains might have been found and tested? Yes. Okay, I'd move at this point for the admission of States Exhibit 301. Mm -hmm. Okay, so show the jury what we're looking at at 301. Or tell the jury, please. So this is a picture of the blanket. And then the blanket was submitted for serology and or DNA testing. What serology testing is, is what we're trying to do is identify bodily fluids on an item of evidence. And at the FBI laboratory, we test for blood and or semen. And there's two types of tests that we perform in the laboratory. The first is called a presumptive test. And this is to indicate whether blood and or semen is on an item. And the second test that we perform is a confirmatory test. And this is to identify if blood and or semen is on an item. So for this item, um, it went through serology testing and I asked the biologist to perform blood testing on this item. And they will look at the item and identify any stains that are on the item and they will circle it and they will put a mark on it. So there is a circle with a one next to it. And that was the stain that was identified by the biologist. Um, and it was uh, serology testing was performed on that stain. Okay. So that, that little circle that's by identified as one, that's what was tested? Yes. But also they look at the whole blanket to test all the individual stains that they see. But anything that is positive, they will circle and mark with a number. Okay, so um, what was that positive for? So this was initially looked at for blood, and so blood was indicated on this item. Okay, and, and then 5-1, when you do the DNA comparison and the DNA testing for that, what's that process like? So for DNA testing, that's a five-step process that we perform at the FBI laboratory, and the first step of that process is called collection. And this is where we take a swabbing or cutting from the item of evidence and we put it into a tube. The second step of the process is called extraction. And this is where we add chemicals to that tube to break open the cells to get to the DNA. The third step of the process is called uh, quanti quantification. And this is where we're trying to determine how much human and or male DNA we have in our sample. The fourth step of the process is called amplification. And this is where we're making millions and millions of copies of the pieces of DNA that I look at that differ from individual to individual. And then the last step of the process is called separation and detection. And this is where the DNA is put on an instrument and it's separated by its size. And the size of those uh, repeats are given a number and those numbers make up a DNA profile. Okay. And so the, the process of creating a DNA profile from this sample, did you do that for each of the items tested, the blankets, the carpet, the swabs from the tailgate? Yes. And did you also do that for each of the known samples that you were given, the swabs from Ms. Bislin, the swabs from Mr. Smith, um, and the bone from Kathleen Henry? Yes. And then did you 
already have a DNA profile for Ms. Abouchet um, from um, New Mexico, as we discussed, or I'm sorry, North Texas, University of North Texas, as we discussed. Yes. Okay. And um, then do you step in to do the, um, the analysis or the comparison process? Yes. So that is part of my job as a forensic examiner. So once all of the DNA testing uh, process has finished or completed uh, by the biologists, I'm reviewing the results of their work and I am interpreting the data and then doing those comparisons from the known DNA profiles from an individual and comparing it to the question samples or unknown DNA profiles from the evidence in the case. And there are possible conclusions that can occur when I do these uh, comparisons. And two main conclusions are an inclusion or an exclusion. An inclusion is when a person of interest is included as a potential contributor to the DNA evidence profile. And then if there's an exclusion, this means that the person could not be a potential contributor to the DNA evidence profile. So let's go with this blanket when you compared it or when you compared the stain, the DNA profile from the stain on that blanket, what could you tell us about it? Were you able to say if it was male or female or something else? Your Honor, may I refer to my notes? Yes. And are you going to look at your report? Yes. So for item five, the blanket, a swabbing was taken from the stain of the blanket, and this was item five, stain one, and male DNA was obtained from this item, and I interpreted the DNA profile as originating from two individuals. I then compared uh, the DNA profiles or known DNA profiles I had in this case, um, and so I compared uh, Brian Smith's uh, DNA profile and the DNA results from item five, stain one, are 33 septillion times more likely if Smith and an unknown, unrelated person are contributors than if two unknown, unrelated people are contributors. And this provides very strong support for inclusion of Mr. Smith. Okay. So he's included as a contributor to that stain. You said a number. Um, 33 septillion. Um, if you were to write that out on the board, 33, how many zeros would follow that for the level of, or for your statistical um, analysis? It would be 33 followed by 24 zeros. Okay. Um, and that's the, how do you describe that for the jury when you talk about the, um, the confidence with which you have in that? Um, in that identification or that inclusion? So when I do a comparison of a known DNA profile to the evidence profile, and I cannot visually exclude an individual, I will use a program called StarMix to calculate a statistic to give weight to the evidence. And the statistic that uh, this program uh, results in is called a likelihood ratio or LR for short. And this is that number, that 33 septillion, that's the likelihood ratio number. And what a likelihood ratio is, it's comparing the probability of the evidence under two opposing scenarios. The two scenarios are if the person of interest is a contributor to the DNA evidence profile versus the second um, a scenario, which is if an unknown, unrelated individual is a contributor to the DNA evidence profile. So the statistic that is calculated um, for this comparison when I um, did it was 33 septillion. And then in addition to that, we provide a verbal equivalency to give context to what that likelihood ratio number means. And it can range from limited support for inclusion to very strong support for inclusion. Um, and in this case, 33 septillion is very strong support for inclusion. Very big number. Yes. So um, did you exclude Miss Henry as a source of DNA on this blanket? Yes, Henry is excluded as a potential contributor to item uh, five stain one. 
Okay, and then um, what did you find about Ms. Bisland with regard to this blanket? So, so the DNA results from item five stain one are equally likely if Bisland and an unknown unrelated person are contributors than if two unknown unrelated people are contributors. Um, is the quantity of DNA that's available to do that examination um, lower in a mixed profile like this where you have two contributors? So there, for DNA, um, we can have uh, limited information, meaning that there will not be information at uh, all the locations that I look at um, in the four DNA profile. I'm looking at a total of 24 locations. Uh, three of those locations help me determine if the profile is from a male or female or a mixture of both. And then the other 21 locations that differ from individual to individual with the exception of identical twins, because they will have the same DNA profile. When I look at those um, I'm determining, do I have information at all those locations? If I do, that's a full DNA profile. If I don't have information at all those locations, then that's a partial DNA profile. And then sometimes if I don't get any information at any of those locations, that means that no DNA profile was obtained. Okay. And when you have a mixture, what multiple people at a, at a profile, how does that impact here or at a, at a, in one sample, how does that impact your analysis? So when I'm interpreting the evidence DNA profiles, um, they can be single source, meaning that the DNA is from one individual. Um, however, it can be a mixture DNA profile, meaning that the evidence profile is from more than one person. Okay. And um, if there becomes multiple people, three, four, five, six, seven people, does it become really hard to, um, to make conclusions about who those people might be? It can be uh, difficult to, in, uh, to interpret uh, the DNA profile if there are uh, more uh, contributors that are contributing. Um, we only interpret at the FBI laboratory up to four individuals. So if there are five or more people um, determined to be on a DNA uh, evidence uh, profile or piece of evidence, um, then we cannot perform comparisons to those. And that has zero to do with this blanket, but just information in general, like if four of us stood up and touched this same microphone um, all day long, um, every day, it would be really hard to separate us out on this, on a DNA analysis you did. Is that correct? So if four people were to touch or handle the microphone, you know, my expectation would be that I would get a DNA profile, um, which would be a mixture of four uh, people. Um, but depending on how long a person came into contact with that item, um, how long they were holding it for and other factors, um, sometimes I can uh, use the program called StarMix to individualize or separate out those four contributors or four DNA profiles to see uh, who's contributing um, the DNA to um, the evidence. Okay. And you talked about like how long or for what duration somebody comes into contact with something. Um, if it's say a car door handle and you just opened it quickly or didn't touch it more than once or twice, is there necessarily an expectation that you would find DNA in something like that? Not necessarily. So if I were just to do a quick touch of the desk and then take a swabbing of the desk, um, not necessarily will I re, uh, get a DNA profile or my DNA profile um, if I were to swab it just because it is a quick touch. Um, however, if I'm handling an item uh, for a longer period of time or take a, you know, a swabbing or cutting from my shirt or collar, um, my expectation is that there would be a DNA profile that's obtained from those items. So we've talked about the results for Mr. Smith, Ms. Henry, um, Ms. Bisland on this blanket. Um, did you later when you got that DNA, DNA profile for Ms. Um, about Chuck, did you make any conclusions about whether she was visible in that state? So when I performed the comparison to Ms. Abachuk, she was excluded as a potential contributor to item five, stain one. 
I want to move on to the next item that you tested. What is in, well, let me go ahead and admit the exhibit first. What is in 302? State's exhibit 302, the photograph in front of you. So this is a picture of item uh, six, which is the carpet. Okay. And is that the item that you tested when you talked about um, item six in your report? Yes. And is that a fair and accurate photograph of the carpet as the as the lab examined it? Yes. Okay. I move at this point for the admission of 302. No objection. Admitted. Okay. So there are three drawings on the top. Is the top photograph the underside of the carpet? Yes, it is. Bottom side, bottom photograph the top side of the carpet? Yes. What are the markings on the underside of the carpet? So, so there are markings on the underside of the carpet to show where the stains are that were tested for blood. Okay. And um, what determinations did you make about um, about each of those stains, taking them in turn. So for this item in particular, item six, the carpet, um, there was the presumptive test that was performed for blood testing on this, um, and it showed that it indicated blood, but also the second type of test was performed, that confirmatory test, and that was also positive. So blood was identified on this item. And so when we talk about six one in your in your report, is that that stain up at the top? Yes. Okay. And so that stain at the top where the one is indicated, um, you had both presumptive and confirmatory tests for blood? Yes. Okay. And what can you tell us about the DNA analysis of that particular stain? So, so after the serology testing was performed on that item, uh, I was taken forward for DNA testing. And I determined that a female DNA profile was obtained from this item, item six, stain one. I interpreted the DNA profile as originating from one individual. I then did uh, comparisons to Mr. Henry and, or Miss Henry and Mr. Smith. And the following individuals are excluded as potential contributors to item six, stain one, uh, which is Henry Ann Smith. Did you then um, can, um, compare it to Ms. Abouchuk's profile? Yes. And what was your finding there? So then I compared Ms. Abouchuk's uh, DNA profile to um, this item and the DNA results from item six, stain one, are 21 quadrillion times more likely if Abachuk is a contributor than if an unknown, unrelated person is a contributor. And this provides very strong support for inclusion of Ms. Abachuk. So like the stain on the blanket coming from Mr. Smith is very strong support for inclusion, the highest level of confidence you can have with including somebody in, in that DNA profile. It's the highest level of support uh, for inclusions that we have at the FBI. Okay. Um, so you can say with confidence that Ms. Veronica Abaucha, there's very strong support for her inclusion in the DNA profile derived from the blood on the bottom of that carpet. So I can't say that the DNA profile is from the blood, um, but I can say that the cutting that was taken from the blood stain that was on the bottom side um, of the upper edge of the carpet, Ms. Abachuk was uh, matching or included to that stain. Um, and the likelihood ratio number is 21 quadrillion, which is very strong support for inclusion. 21 quadrillion is 21 with how many zeros behind it? It's two one followed by 15 zeros. Okay. Um, let's talk about item six two, which is the second stain on that carpet. Um, what can you tell us about that stain? Was it male DNA or female DNA or something else? So item six uh, stain two was swabbings from the stain from the bottom side, lower left part of the carpet. Male DNA was obtained from this stain, and I interpreted the DNA profile as originating from two individuals. 
Okay, so again, a mixture, if you will? Yes. Okay. And when you um, did your analysis, what was the result when you compared it against Mr. Smith? So the DNA results from item six to item two are 4.1 million times more likely if Smith and an unknown unrelated person are contributors than if two unknown unrelated people are contributors. And this provides very strong support for inclusion of Mr. Smith. Okay. So again, the highest level of confidence that the FBI reports out for, for Mr. Smith being a contributor to that stain. The highest level for our inclusions on the verbal scale is very strong support for inclusion. Yes. Okay. And then what happened when you compared that stain to Ms. Abouchuk? So when I compared Ms. Abouchuk to this uh, stain, the DNA results from item six, stain two, are 90 times more likely if two unknown unrelated people are contributors than if Abachuk and an unknown unrelated person are contributors. And this provides limited support for exclusion of Ms. Abachuk. Okay. And there's like the inclusion or exclusion scale. Um, where does that fall on, on that scale? When you say limited support for exclusion, you're not making an identification, certainly. You're not saying she's included. I'm not saying that this is an inclusion or an, I'm not outright saying that this is an exclusion. Uh, what this resulted in a likelihood ratio number of uh, that was limited support for exclusion, meaning that when I did the comparison of Ms. Abachuk to the DNA evidence profile collected from the stain, her profile did not fit well uh, within the profile that was obtained, and therefore it was limited support for exclusion. Okay. And then um, with regard to stain 6-3, the third stain on the bottom of that carpet, um, what were your results? So item six, stain three, which was a swabbing of the stain from the bottom side, lower right of the carpet, Male DNA was obtained from this item. I interpreted the DNA profile as originating from one individual. I then compared Mr. Smith's DNA profile to this item, and the DNA results from item six, stain three, are 150 septillion times more likely if Smith is a contributor than if an unknown, unrelated person is a contributor. And this provides very strong support for inclusion of Mr. Smith. And when you say very strong support for inclusion, it's 150 plus how many zeros? So this is one five followed by 25 zeros. Okay. 150 septillion was the likelihood ratio that you came out for Mr. Smith for that stain. Yes. Okay. And then what about Mr. Bouchuk on that third stain on the carpet? So when I compared Ms. Abachuk's uh, DNA profile to this stain, um, item six stain three, she was excluded as a potential contributor. So I want to move to the next item, 303. What is 303? So exhibit number 303 are pictures of item seven, which is a piece of carpet, and item eight, which is also a piece of carpet. And do those truly and accurately depict the items seven and eight as they were um, received and then processed by the lab? Yes. I move for the admission and publication of 303. Okay. Admitted, you may publish. Okay. So let's talk about items seven and eight. On item seven, which is that the one on top? Yes. Okay. Um, what was the initial um, biological result on seven? So for item seven, the carpet, blood was indicated on this item. Okay. And um, was it then confirmed? No. Okay. What does that tell you? Um, so it just means that blood was indicated on the item and I wasn't able to identify uh, blood on this item. Okay. And then how do you go about testing it then after that to match a DNA profile or not? 
So then uh, swabbing uh, was taken from this stain um, and DNA testing was performed on uh, the swabbing. And were you able to do DNA testing on it? Yes. Okay. And what were the results? So for item seven, uh, stain one, the swabbing of the stain from the top near the center of the carpet, no conclusion regarding sex typing results can be provided for item seven, stain one, and no autosomal DNA typing results were obtained from item seven, stain one. Therefore, no comparisons can be made. Okay, so you weren't able to, you, there was insufficient DNA to make a comparison? Correct. So there was no uh, DNA uh, typing results that were obtained to make a comparison. And then for the sex typing results, that was inconclusive. So I'm not able to tell if the profile is from a male or female or a mixture of both. Now, when you talk about there being a presumptive positive test for blood and then unable to do a, a confirmation, would cleanup efforts um, hamper that confirmation? It could. Okay. I want to talk about item eight then, the carpet on the bottom. Um, what can you tell us about item eight? So item eight, um, which is a carpet, uh, blood was also indicated on this item. Okay. And um, then was that confirmed? No, it wasn't confirmed. Okay. And then were you able to do DNA um, comparison? Yes, so DNA testing was performed on this item. So a uh, swabbing was taken of the stain across the bottom side of the carpet. And this was item eight, stain one. Male DNA was obtained from this item. And I interpreted the DNA profile as originating from two individuals. Okay. And um, was Mr. Smith included or excluded as one of those individuals? When I compared Mr. Smith, the DNA results from item eight, stain one, are 32,000 times more likely if Smith and an unknown, unrelated person are contributors than if two unknown, unrelated people are contributors. And this provides strong support for inclusion of Mr. Smith. And then what about Ms. Abouchuk? So when I compared Ms. Abachuk's uh, DNA profile uh, to this item, she was excluded as a potential contributor to item eight, stain one. Okay, and again, the language you use for exclusion, what do you use with her? So Ms. Abachuk is excluded as potential contributor. Okay, when I'm reading um, limited support for, oh, that's from a different stain, I'm sorry. So she's she's excluded, but Mr. Smith is included in that scene. Yes. Okay. So I want to talk about the items um, nine and ten, the swabs from the tailgate. Um, and the lab didn't photograph those. Is that correct? That is correct. And um, does the process work the same way that we discussed before for um, DNA testing and analysis? Yes. So for the swabs that were taken from the tailgate, um, they were tested for blood and, as well as taken forward for DNA testing. And so nine and 10, the swabs from the tailgate itself, um, was blood identified on swabs nine, nine and 10? Yes, blood was identified on uh, items nine and 10, which were the swabs from the tailgate. And what can you tell us? Was that confirmed? Yes. So con it confirmed means that blood was identified because the second step um, of the serology testing is the confirmatory test. And this is to identify um, the bodily fluid on the item. And what can you tell us about the profiles that were derived from that? Were they male or female? So, so for items nine and 10, female DNA was obtained um, from these two items. And then I interpreted the DNA profile as originating from one individual for items nine and 10. Okay, so a single source, one profile there. Yes, for both items. And when you compared that single source or one DNA profile to Ms. Bisland, Ms. Henry, and Mr. Smith, what did you find? 
uh, they were all excluded. So Ms. Bislin, Ms. Henry, and Mr. Smith were all excluded as potential contributors to items nine and 10. So the blood on the tailgate um, does not belong to any of those three individuals. Again, I can't say that the DNA profile um, that was obtained from these items are from blood um, because there's the potential for skin cells because a person can touch a tailgate. Um, and so I can't directly identify that the DNA profile is from blood. Um, so, but what was obtained is a DNA profile um, in that it was from one female individual. And these three individuals are excluded, Ms. Bislin, Ms. Henry, and Mr. Smith. Okay. Was Ms. Abouchuk also excluded from that? Yes. And so the swabs on the tailgate, I just want to be really clear because we had this with another item earlier. It's, it's positive for blood. Yes. But the profile, you can't say necessarily came from the blood because the blood could have, those swabs could have also picked up skin cells or some other touch DNA that's on the tailgate in addition to the blood. That is correct. Um, would you expect that it would primarily come from the blood because that would be the main thing that they're swabbing? Or do you have an ex expectation about that one way or the other? Um, well, in my expectation, um, it would be that um, DNA is more likely to be obtained from a bodily fluid as opposed to a touch DNA sample, because if you are just touching something, you may not or may not get a DNA profile if you were to just directly touch something. But if you were to handle something for a long period of time, so if you're touching your tailgate um, and holding on to that item for a while, it's possible that your skin cells can be uh, put onto that item. And so you could get the DNA profile from skin cells. And I'm not able to identify whether or not this profile came from blood or uh, skin cells. but you know that a bodily fluid will leave a profile. Yes. Okay. And touch DNA may or may not. Correct. So it's and in this sample, just really quick, you had a single source. You didn't have two profiles mixed together as you did in other cases. Correct. Correct. Okay. Um, but that those swabs from the tailgate were not, did not include Mr. Smith. <clears throat> Correct. Correct. Did not include Ms. Henry. Correct. It did not include Ms. Bisland. Correct. And did not include Ms. Bauchuk. Correct. And then the swabs from, not from the tailgate, but from the truck bed, what can you tell us about those? So the swab from the truck bed, which was item number 11, the swab was tested for blood and blood was not detected on this item. Okay, so we determined that that was not blood. Is that fair? Correct. Okay, and then was there any DNA further testing that was done? No, so since uh, blood was not detected on this item, it was not taken forward for DNA testing. I wanna show you just a couple of items. It's gonna take me one second for everyone to pause it. The first item that I'm going to show you previously admitted as State's Exhibit 45. Do you recognize this item? Yes. How do you recognize it? I recognize it um, by the item number and also the case ID number. Okay. It actually has a little FBI laboratory barcode on it, right? Yes. Is that the blanket that was tested that you talked about um, in your results 5A? Yes, it was. And then I want to show you. Uh, and this is safe. It's in 25. Uh, 
nothing that's been previously admitted as state's exhibit 262. Um, what is 262? It is the carpet. And is that the carpet? That is the subject of, I want to make sure, is that state's exhibit, or not state's exhibit, is that lab item number seven? Yes, this is item number seven. How do you know? Uh, based upon the FBI barcode. Okay. Does it also match the photograph in front of you? Of yes. Item number seven. And that state's exhibit 262. There's one more small one, and then we'll get to the big one. This has been previously admitted as State's Exhibit 260. What is State's Exhibit 260? So this is a, a carpet. Okay. And is that the carpet that is the subject of item eight tested by the FBI Crime Laboratory? Yes, this is item number eight. And how do you know that? Uh, based upon the FBI barcode. Okay. And then the last one I want to show you is what was item number six, and it's pretty big. But we talked about screen state office item. And then roll it this way. One, two, and three. And the state tag number on here is state exhibit 261. What is 261? Um, this is item number six that was tested. Okay. And um, can you tell the jury again? on which stain you found very strong support for including Veronica Boucher. So for item six, stain one, the cutting of the blood stain from the bottom side upper edge of the carpet, Ms. Abachuk was included as a contributor to this DNA evidence profile. And again, the DNA results from item six, stain one, are 21 quadrillion times more likely if Abachuk is a contributor than if an unknown, unrelated person is a contributor. And this provides very strong support for inclusion of Ms. Abachuk. And that stain at six one, did that test positive for blood and also be was confirmed as blood? Yes. And if you could, can I have you come around and hold this up with the jury so you can help me show the jury where stain one is? You actually might not have to come around. Oh, yeah. Can you just hold it right there? Can you show the jury where stain one is? So this is stain one. Right. Can you call the question? Do I have to listen? <laughs> Will there be cross examination? Yep. All right, let's take 15 minutes. Stretch, please. <laughs> Are there matters to take up counsel? There are. Not related to this witness, but to another witness. Um, we might need to have a, this witness can be excused while we do this, but we will need to have a hearing outside of the presence of the jury, likely outside the presence of the prosecution for a witness we intend to call this afternoon, I believe is going to have some um, constitutional issues to raise with the court in a sealed proceeding. <clears throat> Okay, and we don't need to do that before we finish the examination of no, this witness. We can finish this witness, and then I have one other short witness that can go. And then um, we, I'm hopeful we have some time to deal with that okay. today because we only have two other witnesses. And and I got the information of the constitutional implications as we've been sitting here. I, oh. Previously, I expected this witness to testify based on conversations. Okay, so... That's fine. Let's take our break and we'll talk about that when we come back. Okay.
<clears throat> Back on record in State versus Brian Stephen Smith, case number 3 AN 199901 CR. Mr. Smith is here. Counselor here. The jury is waiting. You look like you're ready to go with the cross examination, Mr. Absolutely. He's always ready. Okay, so we're we don't need to take anything else up right now in order to get to the cross examination. No, the other witness is represented, and I've asked Mr. Tetlow to be back here by 1.30. Okay. And so we can just take it up at the end of the day. It's my hope. All right. Thank you. Let's bring the jury in. I know Your Honor has an effort. I have a little bit of time at 1.30, though, so we'll see if we can fit it in. Please be seated, everyone. We have our jury with us. It's 10 minutes after 1. Everyone else is here that needs to be here in order to resume the Brian Smith trial. And uh, Mr. Herr, you may cross-examine witness. Right. Um, Ms. Gregor, you provided the jury some exhibits here and you talked through them on 11 items that you tested for DNA, right? Yes. And those 11 items are those that the sum total of the items you were sent to test in this case? Yes. And the investigators could send you anything they wanted to to ask you to test it, right? Uh, the investigator can send as much evidence to the FBI laboratory as they want um, for a case. However, um, it is up to me to use the information that is given to me from the incoming paperwork to determine how many items to test in a case. And in this case, were there items beyond these 11 items you were sent but didn't test? There were um, other items that were sent but not tested. Right. So were you sent, for example, a uh, homemade silencer or suppressor? No. Um, how about a slightly shorter, fatter homemade silencer or suppressor? No. Uh, a gun? No. Duffel bags? No. Uh, Latex or nitrile gloves? Um, may I refer to my notes, Your Honor? Yes. No. Brown shoelace? No. Cuttings from the interior of a truck? No. Swabs from the interior of a truck? No. A white nylon rope? No. Tarp? No. Any other carpet other than the one we saw in items uh, six, seven, and eight? Nope, just items six, seven, and eight, the three pieces of carpet. So the investigators could have sent you any one or number of those things I just listed, and you could have decided what to test, but they didn't send any of those to you. I did not receive those for uh, serology and or DNA testing, but they could have been submitted um, if the investigator wanted them tested. And you're sent items to test for DNA where at least the investigators expect DNA might be found, right? Objection, speculation. She can answer in her experience, Judge. She has conversations with these people. She's been doing it for years, she said. Overruled. So the evidence that's submitted um, to for a case um, is done by the investigator to see if a DNA profile can be obtained or not. Um, and that is part of my uh, job is to as a forensic DNA examiner to see if I can obtain a DNA profile or not. So if you have a piece of fabric that tests presumptively positive for blood, that might be something where DNA could be found. Yes. And DNA can be left in a lot of ways, right? It can, and there's multiple uh, different things that DNA can be obtained from, such as hair, saliva, skin cells, uh, blood, semen. Uh, sweat? Uh, yes, uh, it can be uh, from sweat. It, if there's um, cells or skin cells from the sweat. Uh, vaginal fluids? Yes. Uh, fecal matter? Yes. Urine? Yes. 
And then to clarify, we saw in a lot of your examples, you talk about somebody being excluded as a source of DNA. Now, when you say excluded, just to clarify here, <clears throat> you're not saying that you don't have sufficient evidence to say one way or the other, right? Right. So I have information to that was obtained from the evidence DNA profile to determine whether or not a person could be included or excluded. And if I have that information to determine a comparison and determine that a person's excluded, then I can say they are excluded from the DNA evidence profile. So what you're saying is you have sufficient evidence, you've done the analysis, and you can affirmatively exclude this person. If I said previously that the individual was excluded as a potential um, individual or contributor to the DNA profile, then I do have sufficient information to make that determination. So, for example, if somebody were lying on a piece of carpet for minutes, if not hours, naked, bleeding, possibly sweating, drooling, um, would you expect there to be a chance of finding their DNA on that carpet? Yes, most likely there would be um, a profile that would be obtained. And you tested these 11 items and then there's sub parts of each item and you did not include Kathleen Henry in a single item that you tested for DNA, right? Correct. And in fact, when you went to the tailgate of the truck, you found female DNA on the tailgate of the truck, right? So the swabs from the tailgate um, had a single source female DNA profile. But it was not Miss Bisland? Correct. She was affirmatively excluded. Yes, she was excluded as a potential contributor. It was not Miss Abouchuk. Correct. She was affirmatively excluded. Correct. And it was not Miss Henry. Correct. She was affirmatively excluded. Correct. That's all I have, Judge. Uh, you were given a hypothetical about, you know, somebody laying on a carpet um, and what or you would expect their DNA. Would it matter how many times the carpet has been, say, vacuumed or cleaned since then? Um, so there, that can affect um, how much DNA um, can be obtained from a carpet. So say if there are skin cells that a person shedded onto a carpet and then you vacuumed those skin cells, well, there's going to be less skin cells present. Um, so there are different factors that can affect the amount of DNA that is left on an item. Okay. Does it matter how many other people have access to that same carpet in the intervening time? So if other people had access to where the carpet is, um, so it's possible that there's going to be uh, more than one person that is shedding their DNA to on the item itself. Um, so it's possible for these types of evidence items to be mixture DNA profiles. Okay. And we talked before about mixtures. You get more than four people in a mixture. Are you able to make any conclusions really? If there's five or more uh, people, um, if I interpret the DNA profile as five or more, then I cannot do uh, any comparisons. So let me give you an example. Say we had eight trials in this courtroom in this month, and you have, you know, juror number one sitting up there, and eight different people then subsequently sat in that chair. Would it be much more difficult to find her there a month from now? or her DNA profile there a month from now? It's possible um, just because of what is known as transfer DNA. So if you are sitting in the chair, you might leave your DNA um, on that chair, but then other factors can affect it. If other people are sitting in the chair, they can take part of your DNA and take it with them uh, once they leave. So there would be a little less amount of your DNA present on that chair. And at the same time, they're depositing their own, correct? Yes. Potentially. Potentially. And you do that eight different times. Would you think that that would be a good source to look for to see if somebody had been there eight, eight trials ago? Um, I would not uh, ha have that as like an item of evidence to uh, test for a case. Okay. 
So um, say hypothetically, this were a different kind of crime scene. You said the detectives can, you know, submit whatever they want, and then you make the decision. If the detective submitted you juror n- number one's chair and said, you know, can you tell me if juror number one said in here, I can tell you affirmatively eight other people were here in the intervening month, and the chair's probably been vacuumed each time in between. Um, would you tell them, sure, I'll test that, or would you say this probably isn't probably isn't a good source of information for me? Well, if it's the only item in the case um, and it was the only one uh, thing submitted, then I could test it and perform that comparison. Um, but again, it would be my expectation that there would be a mixture DNA profile. And if there's five or more people, then I cannot perform comparisons to it. Okay. So if you had other sources of information, you'd encourage them to rely on that instead? Um, I would uh, ask for other um, evidence items to be submitted. Okay. That's the questions I have. Just me a brief recross. I'll allow a brief recross, but then I'm going to give the state the final opportunity. So the state has asked you a lot of hypotheticals about number of people in a certain area, whether you'd expect anything to still be there. Uh, the state focused on skin cells. As we talked about before, there's a number of other ways that DNA can get into a carpet, right? Yes. And as we saw earlier, a uh, carpet was submitted that has stains essentially soaking through it, right? Yes. And that can leave DNA underneath the carpet where the vacuum might not reach, right? That is correct. So that DNA would still be there on that carpet. Yes. Specifically, if bodily fluids had been deposited there, they could very likely still be there. Yes. And if that were the only evidence of somebody's presence in a room, it's something that you might still test. Yes. And when you are given a piece of evidence, for example, say a carpet, do you (laughs) write back the investigators and say, whoa, 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 how many people have been here? What's been going on here? Or do you just test it and, and then say, can't get a profile? What do you think is going on? No. um, So I am testing that uh, based upon the incoming paperwork or scenario that I'm given. Uh, And then if I have additional questions, I can contact the investigator and ask those additional questions if needed for uh, part of the testing that I perform. So some items can be CODIS eligible, which means that the items of evidence or profiles can be put into a database. And sometimes I need to reach out to the investigator to obtain additional information that I don't have to see if it would be eligible for the database. And were you provided a cutting of a hotel carpet in this case? So these were just cuttings um, from the carpet um, that was uh, submitted. And were these the only carpet samples you, that were submitted to you in this case? Yes. Nothing else, Your Honor. All right, then you're done. You may step down. Thank you. Thank you. Did we have another witness we could take up today or no? I do. I don't expect them to be very long. There's four short drone videos this time show. They're less than two minutes each. Okay, let's. Minutes of video. Now it's not for sure. Yeah. Is that okay with everyone if we go maybe five or, or so minutes beyond? Okay, let's bring that witness in here, sir. Your Honor, this is retired Detective Mark Kilsketter. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I mean, good. you got it. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimonial death will be based on the point of court with the whole period of the whole period? Yes, I do. State your name and start your last name. My name is Mark Kilsketter, first name M A R K, last name H U E. L S K O E T T E R. Mr. Hillsketter, can you tell the jury who you are and what you do for a living? Um, so um, I am currently a special agent with the Federal Aviation Administration Law Enforcement Assistance Program. I've been doing that for about three and a half years. Prior to that, I was with the Anchorage Police Department for about 26 years. Um, my background at the police department was varied. I did quite a few different things there. I was a patrol officer. I was a task force officer with the FBI for a couple of years. I spent about 13 years working uh, investigations involving homicides. I was promoted to sergeant in 2013, where I worked uh, patrol again. And then the final five years of my career, I was assigned to the FBI on the Joint Terrorism Task Force. In addition to that, uh, I was on the special assignments unit for the SWAT team, where we 
uh, basically handled all the equipment that the SWAT operators used to, to stay safe. And I brought the new technology to the department, which was uh, unmanned aerial systems or drones. So that's something you actually brought into the APD? Yes. What was the purpose of that? Uh, drones in law enforcement is relatively new technology. Uh, essentially, a drone is an unmanned aircraft that can, can fly in and out of scenes. It can collect evidence. Uh, it's a great tool for situational awareness. Uh, and it, it can document uh, a scene both uh, with video and photo photographs. And is it now um, more widely used even in active scenes as well as in searches? Yes. Okay. And um, did the drone play a role in the case involving Brian Smith and your involvement on October 2nd, 2019? Yes, it did. Um, tell the jury about that. Uh, on October 2nd, 2019, I responded out to a scene on the Seward Highway. I was requested by our crime scene team to come document certain uh, aspects of the scene with the drone. And I'm going to show you, if I may, approach what's been marked for identification as state exhibits 304 through 307. These are basically the front opening shots from those, and they're double-sided there. So we've got 304, 305, 306, and 307. Can you take a look at those real quick? Um, yes. In preparation for trial, have you had the opportunity to view the videos that correspond to those front photographs from the videos, essentially screenshots from the beginning of the videos? Yes. Do they all fairly and accurately depict the scene at mile 108.5 of the Seward Highway as you saw it um, on October 2nd, 2019? Yes. Um, do you think it would assist the jury to see that scene in that way through the drone footage? I do. Okay, I'd move at this point for the admission of state's exhibits 304 through 307. Okay. Admitted. Okay, and the exhibits themselves are the drone video, so it would be on the thumb drive for the jury. Um, but let's go ahead and start here with 304. As we look at this area, what is the jury seeing? The jury's seeing a uh, portion of the Seward Highway uh, where the train tracks run right next to it. Uh, I don't remember the mile marker off the top of my head exactly. Uh, with the pullout where the, uh, at the upper part of the page where the crime scene van is currently located. So this video is taken essentially from the northern part of the scene looking back towards the south. And the two vehicles there on scene that aren't the crime scene van up top were those both um, railroad vehicles? I believe they were. Let's go ahead and move to 305. Um, what is 305? 305 is uh, going to be a video that starts down at the lower portion of the scene where the uh, where the victim was located and then rises up in a way, kind of giving you an overall perspective of the scene as a whole. Does it give a good perspective of the slope of that embankment uh, where the, the victim lay at the bottom? I believe it does. Now, what is 306? So 306 is another video taken of the scene, uh, starting with uh, where the victim was located. And it, I believe this one pans up towards the, the uh, pullout area of the highway.
And then the last exhibit, exhibit 307. So 307 is going to be another video of the, of the scene, uh, and it's kind of documenting from the top of the pullout area down to where the victim is located. Now to create these videos, are you standing up at the top by the crime scene team van? Yeah, my position was located just in front of where the, the crime scene team van was located in the pullout at, the, at that mile post. Okay. And did you then um, upload these videos so that they could be accessible to the detectives working the case? Yes, I did. Okay. And at that point in your career, had you spent several years investigating homicide cases? I have. I had approximately 13 uh, years of experience prior to this. But you weren't um, in the homicide unit when this happened? Correct. So this is the limited capacity in which you came in? Yes, this was it for me. Okay. Um, and are you using the, you know, the technology that you brought to APD and some of those skills in your, your current job? Uh, the knowledge I brought, I, I use more than the technology. Sure. Um, but you're at the FAA now, is that what you said? Yes. Okay. That's all the questions. You. Thank you. You're done. Thank you. And that is it for the day, folks. Uh, I'll release you for the evening. We'll see you back here again tomorrow, tomorrow morning. 8.30, please. <laughs>